So it's my pleasure to officially open the fifth international head and neck cancer conference virtually from our beautiful city of Edinburgh. I'm here in the Scottish Parliament and I'd like to express a warm welcome to everyone attending. I'm very sorry you can't be in our beautiful country of Scotland at this time and we do look forward to seeing you in the future at some point. At the conference we have speakers from as far afield as South Africa and the USA and we also have speakers closer to home from England and also from Scotland's capital city here in Edinburgh. We all know that COVID-19 has greatly impacted all of our lives and we know that it has had a negative impact on cancer diagnoses, referrals and treatments across the world. Fewer people are being seen by their doctor and this is deeply worrying. And I, I know that you will all be discussing this and so much more. So can I take this opportunity to wish you all well and hope you have a great two day virtual conference. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the 2020 Virtual International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. Hello. This is Ian speaking, consultant ENT, surgeon, head and neck surgeon, NRS fellow, clinical reader at Edinburgh University, an all round good guy. Hello Ian, it's Chris. Chris who? Chris, the bloke from Blackpool. You know, Swallow Charity. Oh yes, of course, Sharon's husband. Um, how can I help? I'm ringing about the conference. Oh yeah. The International Head and Neck Cancer Conference 2020. That's the one. Sounds great. Where's it at? Edinburgh. That'll be amazing. I bet everyone's really excited about that. People of the United Kingdom. Now is the time for everyone. Slow the spread of coronavirus. No one knows how long it'll last. Oh, flipping heck. I'll see. So what do we do now? Fear not, Ian. I have a cunning plan. No, don't take me to your leader. He's a bit of a pillock. Welcome to your new look conference. Coming to you from the edge of space. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to this year's president, Mr. Ian Nixon. Uh, full title, please. Oh, for goodness sake. Consultant, ENT, head and neck and thyroid surgeon, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and an all round good guy. Perfect, thanks. Chris, is this costume absolutely necessary? The email says Star Wars and you're wearing Star Trek. Does it matter? Well, obviously not. This is the last one they had left at the shop. Doesn't matter, the effect's ruined now. That's logical, Captain. Beam me up. Welcome to the International Head and Neck Cancer Conference 2020. This year has been hosted in Edinburgh. Clearly, it's a different situation this year and we're hosting virtually. But hopefully, the programme will have an Edinburgh theme and there will be speakers, both from internationally and from locally in the Edinburgh area. So I'd like to thank NHS Lothian Health Board uh, for allowing us to host this. Uh, here we provide head and neck cancer treatment for South East Scotland. We have a population of around 1.1 million coming from Fife, Dumfries, the Borders and the Edinburgh and Lothian region. 
Our multidisciplinary team in Edinburgh consists of ENT surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons, clinical oncologists, clinical nurse specialists, speech therapists and dietitians, as well as a host of other allied specialties that help us to deliver contemporary care for head and neck cancer patients in South East Scotland. It's a shame that circumstances didn't permit us to have this meeting in person, because Edinburgh is a great city and I would encourage you to visit in future. Edinburgh has fantastic history and culture, of course with the Edinburgh Festival, the Hogmanay festivities and the famous Scottish hospitality. Special thanks to the Swallow Charity with Chris and Sharon, without whose hard work this wouldn't have happened. We should also thank the sponsors whose support have made this possible. So as a virtual conference, we're going to run this in two days with two sessions on each day. Each of the speakers will be pre-recorded, but there'll be live question and answer sessions, which will be moderated. And in addition, we'll have a live handover to the 2021 president. We hope that you'll be able to join us live, but if you're not able to, the content will be available to stream at a later date. So welcome to session one on the importance of collaboration between patients, caregivers and healthcare professionals. Does this mirror make me look fat? Hooray! <laughs> Coming up in this first session, we'll be hearing from Kylie Glarusso talking about an oncology dietitian's role. Justin Rowe on improving care pathways. Derek Luthwaite about taking care of our carers. And Whitney Christie about working with a dietitian. At the end of each session, there'll be a question and answer section. Questions and comments too are on Twitter at hashtag, and these are all capitals, HNCCONF2020. And do follow us on Twitter too. So that's what's coming up. Now don't forget to download your copy of the Delegate eBook. To start the conference, we're going to turn to Emma, who's going to talk about her salivary gland cancer journey. Emma Kinlock is a cancer survivor and the founder of Salivary Gland Cancer UK, a charity focused on both patient and carer support and furthering research into salivary gland cancers. Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you're joining us from today. I'm Emma Kinlock. I'm the founder of Salivary Gland Cancer UK, and I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking today at the Swallows 2020 International Head and Neck Cancer Conference. I will be talking about the importance of collaboration between patients, carers and health professionals. And I'm going to be using the story of how Sir Life Gland Cancer UK came to be to demonstrate the power of these collaborations. So without further ado, let's get started. I was diagnosed in the summer of 2012 with a rare salivary gland cancer called adenoid cystic carcinoma. Now you may remember that 2012 was the year that the Olympic Games came to London and I am a Londoner, yet I did not see one single event despite the fact that they were taking place very near to where I live. I did however have surgery for my cancer and that was followed up in the autumn of that year with radiotherapy. During my treatment and recovery, I quickly realised that there was a large area of unmet need and many challenges associated with this cancer. For patients and carers, and for their treating clinicians, and for researchers, I wanted to do something to change that. Before I go into the detail of what we've done, let me tell you a little bit about salivary gland cancers and why they are rare. So, I always used to think that something rare was great, you know, gemstones, diamonds, they're rare, saffron's rare, going to the South Pacific is rare, I mean, all good things really. However, rare diseases and rare cancers are not good things. Um, 
saliva gland cancers, despite the fact that there are over 23 of them, they only represent less than half a percent of new cancer cases globally. Azenoid cystic carcinoma is the most common of them, and that affects around five people per million per year in the UK. So, um, ACC arises in the secretory glands and is most often found in the head and neck, in the parotid or the submandibular glands. But it can also occur in the trachea, in the lac lacrimal gland, the breast, the skin and the vulva. ACC has many specific challenges and I'm going to start by describing them before telling, the, telling you what we've done to address them through collaboration. So firstly, the challenge of getting a diagnosis. So ACC is an equal opportunity cancer. It shows no bias. It is not inherited. It is not associated with lifestyle choices such as smoking, and it's not associated with ethnicity. It can strike at any age, and the average age of diagnosis is younger than for other cancers. Quite often patients don't show symptoms, they're asymptomatic, and when you do have symptoms, because there are no clearly associated risk factors and no links to gender or age or ethnicity, they can be easily mistaken for less serious conditions. So for example, if you're a 25 year old young man and you're a marathon runner and you suddenly develop, um, you know, uh, breathing difficulties and you go to your GP, they might well think that you have asthma or an allergy. They're not likely to necessarily think first off that you have a cancer growing in your trachea. Similarly, if you're a woman in your mid-30s and you have a very stressful job and you grind your teeth, if you start getting pain and shooting pains in your face and neck region, the first assumption may well be that you should change your job and stop being so stressed and grinding your teeth, not that you've got a bowl of cancer growing in the middle of your head. To add to the complications, ACC may not show up on scans. So PET scans rely on the cancer cells um, eating glucose quicker than the other cells, and ACC doesn't always do that. So it can show up um, as negative on the PET scan, or not show on the PET scan. It doesn't always, but sometimes. And ACC looks different to other tumour types. It grows along nerves, and it usually grows very slowly. So assuming you've overcome the challenges of getting a diagnosis, the next set of challenges you face are around treatment. So because um, diagnoses are often later, people are often diagnosed at stage four, um, this means that they um, have more radical treatments. More radical treatments mean poorer outcomes and increased use of um, uh, extensive surgery. Um, patients lose their eyes, their jaws, um, parts of their tongue. Um, they may need to be reconstructed, they may not be able to be reconstructed, and they may use a prosthesis for the rest of their life. If a tumour is inoperable, um, they may be treatable by radiotherapy alone. Until recently, we didn't have proton beam therapy as a treatment option in the UK. That's changing, or has changed. Um, but we still don't have carbon iron treatment in the UK, and there is no referral mechanism to the European centres for that treatment, if that would be appropriate for you. So surgery and radiotherapy are the main treatment options for this disease because there are very limited, in fact, not really any clearly identified or um, available um, targeted drug therapies or chemotherapies. So if you are a patient with an incurable or metastatic disease, current chemotherapy regimes have very poor results. Um, further complicated by the fact that ACC likes to metastasize and you can have metastatic growth even um, appearing after 10 years of being cancer free after your um, treatment for your primary. Um, Patients require, therefore, ongoing um, monitoring for many years and ongoing scanning for patients um, has its own unique set of challenges. Um, so, 
Those are the challenges for treatment. Let's also just talk a little bit about the challenges for research into these cancers. So very little is known about the biology of ACC. And as I said, there are no targeted drug therapies um, available at the moment, and there is limited research. I must say, though, in the eight years since I was diagnosed, this has got considerably better. There are um, lots uh, more people working around the world on this, and information is feeding through, and trials are underway. So it, it, it is much better than it was. But at the time that I was treated, there was a massive unmet need in research and very little, in fact nothing really, well very little, was being done in the UK. And that's not to take away from the people that were doing amazing things, there wasn't some limited research and um, uh, going on. But um, there was a, a lot more needed to be done. Low patient numbers for these cancers mean that it's hard to get the right number of patients in a trial. And if you don't have a significant number of patients in a the trial, then you don't really prove anything in your trial. Um, so do we need to be clever about trial design? Do we need to think more about basket trials, where you have different types of um, cancers all in the same trial? Um, and do we need to think more cleverly about drug repurposing? Interestingly, I wonder whether um, the, um, the re drug repurposing and the very quick uh, trial um, delivery or getting them up and running for COVID, I wonder if this will affect um, uh, cancer research trials in a positive way. Let's hope so. Other challenges of research include the need for international collaboration, you know, to get those numbers, to share, you know, understanding, to share data, to share results. Um, will this be affected by Brexit? We still don't know that yet. Um, challenges are also that when you um, collaborate internationally, do you have the same sort of data set? Are you looking at the same things? Um, I think from a financial perspective, if you're a, a pharma company and there's sort of five patients for every million, that's you know less financial incentive for you to um, work too hard on that, rather than if there were sort of you know fifty thousand. Um, and the, where there is research, then the last point here is that actually getting access to those trials. Um, it, how, how do we do that? Are we able to move? Um, through Europe, uh, through the world to access trials and are there cleverer ways to do that. So overall um, a greater understanding of these cancers is needed and um, the last point about the challenges of, of these cancers is, um, I, I'll go through this very quickly because I'm sort of singing to the choir here, that um, you will all recognise um, a lot of these points. Um, so, uh, but specifically to cervical cancers and amyloid cystic carcinoma there was a lack of sort of specific information and UK based specific support. Um, so some treatments, especially experimental treatments, we don't know the consequences of them. Um, the challenges also uh, of living with a chronic condition, um, the added complexity of metastatic disease um, and ongoing monitoring. And then as with all cancer patients and certainly all head and neck cancer patients and certainly for this group of cancer patients, there is the ongoing fear, fear of recurrence, fear of death um, and f anxiety about having scans and anxiety about not having scans. And then for many, there's the aspect of post-traumatic stress from having had the diagnosis and been through the treatment um, because it, it really is quite a thing. So, just a few areas to address then. Um, and after I had been treated, I had set up a um, support group in the hospital that I was treated in. And I started it in collaboration with a nurse, a CNS. Uh, and we still work together today on it a number of years later. To my great surprise, it was actually running really well. Um, and it was starting that group and recognising all these challenges and unmet needs that put me on the path to being here with you today. So before I go any further, um, I'm, let's just, just ponder for one moment exactly what um, collaboration is, because that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's just start with the definition. Collaboration is 
the action of working with someone to produce something. I would also say that some of the keys for successful and productive collaboration is listening to others, learning from them, accepting different viewpoints, experiences and perspectives. We need to embrace diversity and we need to use it to strengthen the work that we're doing and to generate the best outcomes possible. After a while of running the support group, my attention was drawn to the National Cancer Research Institute in 2015. The NCRI have a number of research groups and they're focused on specific cancers and working in a collaborative way, bringing together all members of the MDT and beyond and the patient voice to move forward research in cancer. I ended up joining the head and neck group and I was a little upset initially that there were no ACC or saliva gland cancer trials. So imagine my amazement one day when I'm on a conference call and a researcher called Dr. Robert Metcalf comes on the line and he suggests an ACC trial. I literally could have reached down the phone to shake his hand um, and from that moment on we started collaborating to um, meet the unmet needs for ACC and saliva gland patients um, and move forward research. So how have we done this? Well, what we've done to address the unmet needs was starting a charity. In April 2019, Saliva Gland Cancer UK was launched. Um, as I've outlined, it is a unique collaboration between a patient advocate and a medical oncologist. We use co-production to build an active patient and research community. And we think we're quite unusual in that we're founded by a patient advocate and by a clinician together. We want to understand the biology of saliva gland cancers. We want to advance research, develop new treatments. We want to provide peer support, reliable information to patients and carers. We are developing a network and we want to create the network to be unique. Clinicians and patient collabor collaborators across disciplines and across regions to include all interested parties in our work. Patient carer involvement is represented in everything that we do. Our philosophy is that patients shouldn't be used on a consultative basis in terms of inputting into strategy and research. They are not a box to be ticked on the form. They are integral to all levels of the process. Um, so with that, I'm now going to talk through some examples of how we've used these collaborations to move things forward and to show you just how powerful collaboration can be. So let's start with how we've used patient carer and clinician collaboration to move things forward. We have regular meetings, primarily for patients and carers, but attended by clinicians and open to all. We usually have around 30 to 50 patients and carers and we gather four times a year. We used to do our meetings in person, but sadly, and we all know why, we now use Zoom. And I very much hope that that will change in 2021, but we shall see. In our meetings, we always provide patients and carers with an opportunity to share their stories and then we follow up with a research update from the clinicians so they can understand the work that we've been doing and what's been happening in other places worldwide to drive forward our shared goals, need for better research um, and ultimately improve outcomes for patients. We also have guest speakers to address any topics that the group wants to hear about. So, for example, our next meeting on October, the, oh, our last meeting on October the 31st, um, uh, we had uh, an address by a, um, a psychologist to talk through post-traumatic stress and um, anxiety. Um, we always want to respond to our attendees and we're really open to agendas and who we have present um, in our future meetings. Um, we found that one of the great things about having clinicians there is that we can answer a lot of questions on the spot. Um, and just to reiterate the point, these meetings are open to all. And at the end, I'll share contact details. So if you did want to join, very welcome. 
Um, the second thing we've done through our um, patient care and clinician collaboration is that we have trial discussion days. So where a researcher or a clinician has a trial proposal, they can come and present to a group of our patient network. And this ensures that um, patient input is there right from the start and that the trial is thoughtful and developed in a way which makes sure that patients take part no trial is any good if no patient takes part in it. You know, trials need patients. Therefore, it's important that the design is appropriate and isn't asking patients to do things that they quite simply won't do. Especially at the moment when we are in a resource-constrained environment, there is limited funding for trials um, and that is likely to continue for a little while. So the patient input at this level is hugely important. Um, this, the third thing is our U SGC UK strategy days. So we um, gather a group of patients and clinicians together and we talk through what is important to them. And we feed these into our organisational priorities. It's patient and carer's chance to tell us what is missing in their journey so far, what can we do to move it forward? And early 2021, we very much look forward to sharing our 2021 priorities based on these discussions. Um, the collaboration has also raised awareness. So um, with both clinicians and patients telling people about us and what we do, we've managed to grow our network significantly in the first year. We've got leaflets to send out to people. So let us know if you would like one or several rather. So the next thing that we've been able, the next area we've been able to significantly um, develop in and collaborate in is our UK wide collaborations. So we've managed to extend and I'm delighted to say that um, clinicians are now referring patients from all over the UK and beyond to our specialist hub at the Christie NHS Foundation Trust in Manchester, which is where Dr. Robert Metcalf has his clinic. He also has a biobank there for, of tissue samples, which is being built up to feed research both in the UK and internationally. We had a clinical trial um, open last year at the Christie Hospital for ACC patients, which was amazing. Um, we also collaborate with the um, National Cancer Research Institute and their Consumer Forum, which, which is a group of patients and carers who are um, interested in research uh, across all cancer types, and I currently chair that forum. And um, patient and carer support organisations, um, obviously we collaborate those, with those as well, but, but, but support, patient and carer support organisations are the focus not just in head and neck cancer, but also in rare cancers as well. Next, we collaborate internationally. So, um, Robert Metcalf and myself are part of the International Rare Cancers Initiative um, and this is a great example of where in information learning and cross fertilization of ideas takes place around the world. As an organisation, um, I uh, and myself, uh, we represent um, saliva gland cancers uh, in Eurocan Domain 7, um, the um, head and neck, rare head and neck cancer domain. We um, collaborate with patient organisations such as Euroidus, we collaborate with research foundations such as the ACC Research Foundation and we undertake project work internationally um, developing international guidelines, um, looking at building a registry, developing and delivering training courses. The last area that I'm going to mention is um, our patient carer collaboration. And since we started over a year ago now, um, this has just been amazing. On an individual level, um, patients providing support to each other has just been overwhelming sometimes. We've given people the opportunity to meet others with the same disease for the first time. 
We found that there are network, networks of patients out there, but with no organisation to give them a home before now. So when we had our acidic cell focus meeting, I had a couple of patient contacts, and through them we had 10 people join. Now, 10 people is not a big number, but it's a big number for a silic cell carcinoma. And these patients had developed their own little group internationally, and now they can come and, and be part of our group and have a bit more structure, and it was just amazing. Um, and that's been one of the great things as well about the last year is we've expanded from adenoid cystic carcinoma into supporting all salivary gland cancers. The second thing is sharing information. Um, patients and carers have just been amazing in supporting us, um, providing information about us, providing information to us, what we're doing, what we are going to do being shared through Twitter and Facebook. I mean, it's just been amazing. Um, and we're constantly updating the information we have and we see people sharing. So thank you, everyone, that's done that. Um, We've seen our patient care and collaborations expand awareness with clinicians, patients te telling clinicians about us if they didn't know about us, um, refer, you know, getting clinicians to refer patients to Dr. Metcalf. Um, our consultative committees, um, either for temporary, as I've outlined, um, or um, more permanent, and we'll be building those out in 2021 with the help of all our patients and carers. So the last thing I want to mention is um, at an organisational level, um, and this is from a personal level as a patient advocate. So um, we, can, um, we collaborate with a number of organisations um, focused on head and neck cancer support, research and rare cancers, as I mentioned earlier, but I just want to expand on that. Um, it's not always easy doing patient advocacy. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. Often you're not paid for your time and you have to work quite hard to establish yourself. Um, people share their stories, they share their pain and they share their suffering. And some people die. Sometimes you can feel that none of it's helping and you're not getting anywhere. But then you remember that if just one person feels less alone or enters into a trial that could save their life, then you've done something and it's a good thing. Quite simply, collaboration is the key to the success of all of this. Collaboration between patients, carers and health professionals. We need each other. We need to work together. We quite simply need to work together to move things forward for us all. This is my last slide. I just want to say thank you for listening. Launching Salivary Gland Cancer UK as a unique collaboration is addressing the unmet needs for salivary gland cancer research in the UK and beyond for clinicians, researchers and those affected by these rare cancers. A valuable database is being established to drive forward national and international research. Reliable information and support is being provided for patients, their carers and treating clinicians. And there is so much more that we're planning, but I don't have time to tell you about that here and now. But please know we are open to collaborating with all of you. Please get in touch if you're a clinician, patient, carer, healthcare professional, pharma company, or just interested in salivary gland cancer, cancer and working with us. Contact details are here. You can join our network, email us, tweet, or join us on Facebook. The very last thing I want to say is thank you to everybody that has supported us so far. And within that, Thank you to Chris and Sharon and the Swallows. Thank you for inviting me to speak. Thank you for your amazing work. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your collaborative spirit. I'm very much looking forward to the rest of the conference. And with that, I will say goodbye. And thank you all for listening. My wife said, if I buy one more guitar, she's going to leave me. God, I'm going to miss her. Actually, probably not. 
Hurrah! Hi, I'm Scott Benson. I'm a Member of Parliament for Blackpool South. I'm delighted to extend a warm welcome to everybody who's listening at home to this fifth International Head and Neck Conference 2020. Chris Curtis does a brilliant job here in Blackpool working with a charity to support those patients and carers. As COVID continues, the implications for that on people's health care across the UK are obviously significant and I continue to work with ministers to make sure that people's cancer treatment is delivered in the usual way, which is so important. But I hope everybody has a great conference. Please do continue the brilliant work you do across the whole world in supporting those people who need it. My name is Lisa and I'm a registered dietitian at a university cancer center in Colorado. I've been working with head and neck cancer patients for close to a decade. And I believe that the registered dietitian and patient collaboration is crucial during treatment. The dietitian can help educate and advocate for the patient so that they make it through treatment um, and optimize their nutrition throughout the entirety of treatment as well as post-treatment. Um, the registered dietitian can provide tips and tricks, especially regarding nutrition, but also other um, medications and therapies to lessen symptoms related to treatment. Good luck with the conference. I hope you enjoy the two days. Sorry we won't have our display stand, but please go to allrelief.co.uk for information, leaflets and any samples you need. Hiya to everybody there at the Swallows Conference from me, Emma, at Bio Extra. We hope you have a fantastic couple of days there. We've attended in the past. Unfortunately, it's all virtual this year. We've thoroughly enjoyed it and we hope you take a lot from the next two days. My message to you from Bio Extra, keep lubricated and keep well. Take care. Bye bye for now. Hi, I'm Linda Tomarelli. I'm a speech and language therapist and I work for Speak Unique. We create personalised synthetic voices for use on communication aids. My role is to support people to go through the voice banking process and to work with healthcare professionals to enable them to help their patients use our voice banking technology. I use my background as a speech and language therapist to help repair voices where the patient may have slowness or slurring and to design voices for people who have no natural speech. This means our personalised voices are accessible to everyone. Speak Unique create personalised synthetic voices for use in communication aids. This allows people to communicate in a voice that is identifiably their own through text-to-speech technology. I'm Ewan MacDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. I'm Ewan MacDonald. I'm from Edinburgh. It's so hard to lose speech, so anything that reduces that sense of gloss helps. In these modern times, medical technology has come a jolly long way. Here you are, sir. Enjoy your leeches. Today's leaders in technology really know their onions with the wonders of modern science. Robotic surgery knows no bounds. I say, you young scallywags, stop playing with the equipment. Indeed, it can breathe new life into patients. Now look at that marvellous healthy glow. Isn't the NHS wonderful? Where would we be without it? Where would we be without it? Where would we be without it? would we be without it? Yes, of course, the NHS really is wonderful. And today more than ever, it's embracing modern technology for the benefit of all our lives. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the field of robotic technology. Cancer patients across the world are living proof that investment in state-of-the-art robotic surgery is working. Science is working and we must continue translating science into better cancer patient care. Hi, it's Mike Heffernan from Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints here. Uh, I hope you're enjoying another conference, albeit in a virtual world. 
Uh, I also thought it would be a good idea just to let you know that we're now working closely with Swallows Charity and you can buy uh, Dr. Hef's Remarkable Mints in our new packaging uh, from our website and you'll get a 5% discount if you enter in the discount code SWALLOWS2020 and the benefit is that Swallows also get a 5% uh, revenue uh, into the charity to continue doing all the great work that they do uh, for both carers and patients alike. I uh, wish you all the very best for the rest of 2020. Bye for now. Hello, my name is Sam and I work for Flen House. Flamagel RT is for the management and prevention of radiotherapy induced skin reactions. It does this by creating the optimum healing conditions to accelerate cell renewal. It provides a protective barrier against external contaminations and provides a cooling effect that reduces pain on the patient's skin. In clinical studies, 7% of patients experience moist decamation when using Flamagel RT compared to 35% of patients using Dexpanthenol. This is why we're pleased to say that 94% of patients said that Flamagel RT met or exceeded their expectation. Mouth Cancer Action Month takes place every November. We work closely with the Oral Health Foundation and all head and neck cancer charities to promote the event when dental practices across the country try to raise awareness of all head and neck cancers. To find out more or to join our annual 10K Awareness Walk, please visit our website www.mouthcancerfoundation.org. Welcome to your New Look Conference, coming to you from the edge of space. Next, we turn to Kylie, who's going to talk about her role as a patient coordinator in the USA. Kylie Glarusso is the oncology dietitian and patient navigator at Lowell General Hospital's Cancer Center in Massachusetts, USA. She is a registered and licensed dietitian and works as a member of a comprehensive multidisciplinary care team in the centre. Oh, I'm the clinical oncology dietitian and head and neck navigator at the Lowell General Cancer Centre in Lowell, Massachusetts, United States. I'm happy to be a part of the Head and Neck 2020 virtual conference, so thanks for having me. I'm just going to talk a little bit about my story of becoming navigator um, and also still functioning as the dietitian for the Cancer Centre. Um, it's been a unique experience, but um, super rewarding and really great. Um, I think that patients benefit a lot from it, and um, it's taught me a lot about the complex complexity of the healthcare system. So just wanted to go through what basically the definition of what patient navigation is. Um, by definition, it's the process by which trained individuals proactively guide patients through and in around all the barriers. Um, in a complex cancer care system um, and they basically want, uh, the goal is to decrease the fragmentation of care and uh, the coordination of the services. Um, so that's just by definition just to give you an idea of what it is. I'm not sure if many of you have had experiences with patient navigators um, through your treatments or at your own facilities. Um, so just wanted to kind of set the basis for what it what the purpose is. Um, I did put a few bullet points on what the focus is. It's patient-centric, patient um, that's the model that I follow. So my, my goals are to deliver the healthcare services um, as thorough as possible and also as streamlined as possible for all of the patients. Um, it's, its core function is to eliminate the barriers to, of healthcare, which I know most of you know how challenging it can be with different appointments, insurances, um, scans, testing. Um, it's, it's pretty much endless, especially for head and neck cancer patients um, where there's so many elements that need to be addressed um, even before starting the treatment. Um, but also, one of the main principles of patient navigation is it should be defined by the, with a clear scope of practice, um, meaning that it just distinguishes the role um, and responsibilities for, of the navigator of that of all the other providers. So I'm known as the patient navigator to, to the patients and family to help them through the, the treatment 
and, and throughout um, their whole entire journey, basically. Um, my huge goal, which I've put um, in red over here, is it's individualized care. So that's um, one of the major things. Not No two people, no two families are the same. So that's why you have to be open-minded and willing to work with different um, cultures, financial backgrounds, um, psychosocial issues. Um, it's, it's complex and you have to be open-minded. So I think that's a huge part of patient navigation. Um, and my goals um, are to improve the patient experience overall, especially within our cancer care system, which we have control over um, the patient experience. Um, and then clinical care coordination. So coordinating all appointments that they need to get through um, in order to get their treatment, whether it be chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, making sure they all have their, their ducks in a row. Um, so why do we need patient navigation? Kind of, I just mentioned, um, there are a lot of barriers in the healthcare system that make it challenging for people to navigate through. And quite honestly, puts delays on certain treatments and even appointments and scans because people don't know where to start um, and not everything is easy to access and plan for themselves. Um, so just a few bullets financial wise um, to help people get where they're supposed to be. So getting things through prior authorizations um, to the financial people, um, who, who needs to look at this so they can start in a timely manner. Um, communication, that's a given. Communication is always a limiting factor in a lot of different areas in healthcare. So if I can be the person to communicate it out, um, a message from providers to patients or vice versa, I'm, I'm really happy to do that. Um, and it's something I like to strive for every day. Um, that kind of goes hand in hand with medical system obstacles. Um, that is always going to be there. Um, so if I can make their journey a little bit easier, where I can be their go-to, and if maybe I don't know the answer, I will find out the answer. I'm, that's what I would like to serve for as the patients. Um, psychological, um, head and neck cancer treatment, as you guys know, is uh, complex and it's uh, very, intense and it's a long journey. It's not just starting chemo and then ending it on this day. It's the before, the during, and the after, the survivorship phase where people need support and guidance. Um, and then caregivers are also very involved. Um, oftentimes there's frustration. Why aren't they eating? Why aren't they doing well? Um, so if I can guide people to, you know, whether it be social worker um, or someone in the community that can help them, I'm happy to connect them with the, the right people. Um, support and guidance, that's the, just the main goals. I serve to support and guide patients and family members through this journey so they can get through it a little bit easier. Um, as Like I said, as you all know, it's a, it's a long journey and it's a challenging one. So um, being a patient navigator is, I think, um, a necessity for head and neck cancer patients. Um, a little bit of the goals of the navigation process. Um, basically, it's just so patients can overcome these healthcare barriers um, through all phases of their cancer um, experience. So not just through their treatment, but at the time of diagnosis. Do they have the next step? Do they know what that means? Um, and then any sort of consultations and then starting the treatments. There's a lot of scans and clearances that need to be done. Um, radiation simulations, dry runs, PET scans. Um, it's pretty much endless. It's it's really intense. There's a lot of appointments. People often tell me, I feel really overwhelmed. Um, I feel like I have appointments all the time and it's true. So um, navigating them through this, this healthcare system um, as far as it relates to cancer care is super important. Um, the outcomes that I've been trying to track on my own are patient and family satisfaction, staff satisfaction, because um, everything is lined up, people know where to find certain information and where the patient is on their treatment plan, um, and improved patient outcomes is the major thing, that's our goal. Um, here at Lowell General, we our motto and saying is patients first in everything we do, um, and I believe by serving as a patient navigator, that is certainly abiding by their their goals. So my transition to Head & Neck Navigator um, came about after doing a little bit of research and learning a bit about what a patient navigator was. Um, and I quite honestly didn't look too much into it only because I 
associate navigation with nursing um, and there's a lot of talk about navigators for breast health but not so much for head and neck cancer patients um, so it, it does make sense though when you actually put the facts out on the table um, right from when patients are diagnosed with head and neck cancer um, a lot of times their nutrition is already uh, compromised they've already lost weight some people walk in the door malnourished already um, so I become involved right from the get-go um, uh, and I the side effects and symptoms um, are nutrition related pretty heavily right from the beginning um, patients are off, often struggle with the inability to consume enough energy, meaning calories and protein. Um, so I'm already helping them do that um, even before they start their treatment. Uh, nutrition therapy is also occurs um, from time of diagnosis and then throughout survivorship. So not during just the treatment am I involved, but afterwards as well. A lot of patients need help with regaining weight or waning off their tube feeding um, or managing their G-tube care. Um, these are things that I was involved with already. So the connection between how can I you know, involve myself formally as a navigator uh, was a no-brainer and it made it easy for me to, to expand this role. Um, and I'm also a part of the multidisciplinary head and neck cancer team, um, which where we meet patients in new consult and follow up and survivorship care and follow through their whole entire journey. Being a part of that uh, multidisciplinary team has given me um, kind of my stepping stone to evolve this into um, the patient navigator. People know me from up front and then they see me and follow up every three months. Um, in coordination of care for nutrition support such as G-tubes or tube feeding or even TPN, um, that is something that I would be involved with up front. So navigating them through that issue at, on an outpatient basis, meaning trying to get insurance coverage um, and trying to get certain things approved for the nutrition support is something I'm involved with. So that helps them be able to have this contact person. Um, patients know to call me um, and figure out what the next step might be. Or, and if I don't, like I mentioned before, if I don't know the answer, I will find out the answer. Um, like I just mentioned, I'm part of the multidisciplinary head and neck cancer clinic that we have here. Um, we are a team of myself, dietitian and navigator, speech therapy, radiation oncologists, and ENTs. Um, we uh, follow patients right from new consult through the treatment and then afterwards into our what we call survivorship phase. Um, this gives a, the patient a full experience on on the on the access to who was involved through their cancer care. Um, so we follow them and address certain issues that might be still lingering, uh, whether it be side effects like dry mouth or pain. Um, and it's really great for the patient because they f don't feel like, what do I do now? Um, they get to see us in, in a cl clinic setting with all of us there at the same time every three months. So nothing goes um, unaddressed and we really like to um, get patients through it best way possible and offer everything we have. Um, different modalities of, of symptom management, even integrative therapies such as acupuncture, um, and then nutrition support, um, swallowing therapy, um, often swallowing therapy, and I work hand in hand to get people eating again um, and actually enjoy it. So that um, meeting as a multidisciplinary clinic uh, during each month is a great way for me to continue out my navigator responsibilities. So following them through the continuum of care, which is the, the main goal of patient navigation. Um, let's see. So my role as a dietitian in the head and neck clinic, I have mentioned I, I do the ass patient assessments um, of their caloric intake and then making sure they're able to tolerate certain textures for food um, and also maintaining a, a stable weight. Some patients still lose weight after the treatment is done so intervention is, is ne necessary um, by a dietitian even throughout after, throughout after their treatment. 
Um, and I did mention also the speech therapist and I work hand in hand to co-treat patients. So oftentimes we will be weaning a patient off of a G-tube so they can start to eat again. Um, and if we work together, they can give them the texture and exercises um, to, to do that with the certain foods and I can tell them how much and what they should try. Um, and it's a really great um, multidisciplinary you know, appointment that we can we offer for patients. Um, and then I just take an active part in the nutrition support. So if I think a patient is really struggling and not going to make it through the treatment um, without either hospitalization or IV fluids, um, I might make the recommendation for nutrition support such as a G-tube or even TPN in certain cases where a G-tube isn't feasible. Um, so having that active role in the head and neck clinic has made it easy for me to transition to the navigator. Um, just a little bit of my responsibilities. I um, facilitate patient appointments um, in, in including those made outside of our cancer center. So whether that be dental clearance or uh, a PET scan, things like that, and make sure that everything is set up for them. Um, so nothing is uh, missed or skipped um, in the process of treatment. Um, and then facilitating appointments, so labs and diagnostics, I can, different specialty uh, physicians, I can make the appointments myself and it helps patients i found who have a contact, one contact person for all of these appointments and different things that are going to pop up. Um, they find it very easy and they really enjoy having someone to just call this one person, not calling different departments waiting on hold, pressing a bunch of different prompts. Um, it's really um, patient-centered, of course, but I think they really benefit from having a navigator. Um, and then I also submit referrals for certain things such as nutrition support. So if a patient is going to have a G-tube placed, um, I'll make the referral for a visiting nurse to come or um, reach out to different vendors for their tube feeding uh, formula and their supplies. Uh, another thing that I also do as a dietitian and navigator is um, teach patients how to use nutrition support if they do end up having um, a G-tube placed. Uh, let's say they have it um, done in our hospital, I'll teach them how to use it the following day. That is also an important part of navigator and a dietitian uh, because a lot of people are overwhelmed with all these appointments suddenly they need they need something placed and they are maybe not sure why. Um, so having me explain it and also teach them how to use things um, and the supplies and how it will function and help them through their treatment is a huge help. Um, I also coordinate resources and provide assistance um, with assessing clinical and supportive care. So if, I, if they mention to me something that's outside of my realm, I reach out to the appropriate person to figure out how we can help them. So just a kudos to my team here. Um, I really owe it all to my multiple, multidisciplinary team who is uh, ENT, Dr. Arthur Loretano, our radiation oncology department, and speech therapy department as well. So I have their pictures here and a fun picture of us on Halloween last year um, with some of the radiation nurses as well. Um, they allow me to um, expand my, my role um, in a seamless way. Um, with their support and guidance, I really um, am able to serve as that liaison link between providers, patients, family, um, and make it a good experience for uh, patients. So I just wanted to shout out to them. So thank you for having me. I really enjoyed this experience um, and hopefully you learned a little bit about how a dietitian can, can serve as a patient navigator. Um, and of course, the, it's patient patient centered model that I follow is through and through the most important thing. Um, so putting a patient first and making it easy for them to navigate the healthcare system um, in our cancer center at least is, is my goal. So thanks for having me and I hope that I get to see some of your faces in real life someday. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the 2020 conference. Thanks.
Hi, it's Guy from CC Med. Just want to wish everyone at Swallows all the best of luck at their virtual head and neck cancer conference. Such a shame we can't be there this year, but let's hope to get some get together next year. We at CC Med obviously look after the AS Saliva or Thyma Dry Mouth range. If you'd like to learn more about that, then please visit us on our website. In the meantime, best of luck. Sure, it's going to be a great couple of days. Really looking forward to it. My name is Amber Thomas. I'm a registered dietitian and a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition. Before I started my own private practice, I worked in a cancer center for over 10 years and we primarily helped individuals through head and neck treatment. And I feel very strongly that working with a dietitian is very important for your success going through such a difficult treatment. The dietitian should be able to help you find foods that you can tolerate, foods that you can eat, which may include things you're not used to or changing uh, the texture or modifying the food in some way because of the side effects that you'll experience. Your dietitian should know the side effects for your particular treatment and be able to provide you guidance even ahead of time before those side effects actually happen so you're prepared and you're ready to stay nourished and stay strong. So working with a dietitian is absolutely so important to help you heal both during the process of treatment and after. Hello everyone, my name is Lewis from Flint Health. Many of us are suffering from skin reactions that often gives us no choice but to give up on the activities that we enjoy the most. We at Flynn Health want to provide innovation that allows everybody to enjoy the life that they love. This year we are proud to be supporting this year's Swallows event and honoured to be involved with such an inspiring charity that work extremely hard to help patients and carers. At this year's event we'll be hosting an educational breakout session which gives you the opportunity to learn more about radiotherapy by one of the country's most respected radiographers. Also a fantastic opportunity to discover a solution for your skin that at present may be very sore, itchy and red following on from radiotherapy treatment. It is extremely important that this year we bring clinicians, patients and supporting companies together as one to be supported and to support others. Hi, this is Joanna Knight from Capitex Healthcare. Uh, we're very proud to sponsor the virtual Head and Neck Conference 2020. Thank you. Ho ho, hee hee, ha ha. Rutherford Cancer Centres. We're here, right where you need us. Hello, my name's Daniel Hughes. I'm from Aspire Pharma and we really hope you're enjoying your conference today. We're here to talk to you today about oral mucositis and dry mouth, specifically alpronite mucosamine. You can find out more information about mucosamine by visiting our virtual stand. We'd love to virtually see you and we hope you have a lovely virtual conference. Hello, my name is Abby Miller. I'm a speech and language therapist working at Chesterfield Royal Hospital in North Derbyshire. I recently won a fellowship from the National Institute of Health Research to help me learn how to carry out research in the health setting. And I'm studying a master's at the University of Nottingham. I would like to use these skills in order to benefit patients with head and neck cancer. We know that people with head and neck cancer return to work less often than people with other cancer types. I really want to understand what it's like to return to work following head and neck cancer, what was tricky or what helped you. 
So I'm keen to speak to anyone who has gone back to work to understand your experiences. And I would do this by a one-off interview, either on the telephone or virtually at a time to suit you. If you'd like to find out more information or take part in this study, that would be fantastic. You're very welcome to contact me on my email address. I also have a Twitter account um, where I recently wrote an article explaining what's happening in the research internationally around head and neck cancer and return to work. So please do contact me or of course you can leave your email address and contact details with Chris and he'll pass them on to me. Thank you. Hello, my name is Philip Lewis. I'm the president of the Mouth Cancer Foundation, the national charity which supports everyone affected by the disease. We work to improve awareness and provide education, both for the public and healthcare professionals. Early detection is the key. That's why we've developed our self-examination protocol. To find out more about us or to join our annual 10K awareness walk, please visit our website, www.mouthcancerfoundation.org. Hooray! Dry mouth affects one in four adults within the UK and can have a significant impact on your overall health. That's why we created Auraleave, a complete oral care range for dry and sensitive mouths. The enzyme system found in all Auraleave products helps supplement natural saliva to help keep your mouth healthy and comfortable. Designed with dry mouth sufferers in mind, our products are free from alcohol or foaming agents that can irritate a sensitive mouth. Headquartered in Luton, Bedfordshire, our small and super friendly team works to help raise the awareness of dry mouth with healthcare providers and patients alike. You can visit our website, drop us an email, or give us a call from Monday to Friday, 9am to 5.30pm. We are ready to answer your questions about our range and process your orders. We love hearing from you. Oraleave, making dry mouths happy again. Hi, I'm Dr. Elaine Emerson, and I'm a research leader at the Centre for Regenerative Medicine, a research centre at the University of Edinburgh. Join me for a special behind the scenes virtual tour of our laboratories and to find out more about our research to develop new treatments for head and neck cancer patients recovering from radiotherapy. Uh, when Chris was diagnosed, he just switched off straight away. He didn't take anything on board. He didn't listen to anything. He just went into his own little zone. He, um, he decided he couldn't peg feed himself. He was just far too lazy to be bothered to do it. He just couldn't be asked, basically. Um, he thought it would be so much better for me to feed him. Um, coming from a day's work, in my black work suit, have to feed him and then decides he's going to cough and this mixture flies all over me and he sits there laughing like a right, you know, clever sod that he is when poor me is dripping in all this food, I've got to clean it up. It's still on the ceiling because he can't be asked to clean it off or even decorate. Um, he went into his own little, what I call cancer bubble, where it was all about him. He didn't care about me or the family. He just sat there like a right miserable little twat. Um, you know, to be honest, that's my nickname for him now, miserable twat. He's not got any better. You know, he puts a big smile on for everybody else, but he don't give a shit about the rest of us. I went to a really tough medical school. We had to find our own cadavers and bring them in. Next, we turn to Justin from London, who's going to speak about the role of a speech and language therapist. Dr. Justin Rowe is a clinical, academic and service lead, specialising in dysphagia in benign and malignant head and neck disease at the National Centre for Ear, Nose and Throat Service at Imperial College Healthcare, NHS Trust. Hello, my name is Justin Rowe. 
I'm a consultant speech and language therapist and joint head of the Department of Speech, Voice and Swallowing at the Royal Marsden NHS Foundation Trust in London. I'm also the clinical service lead for the National Centre for Airway Reconstruction at Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. And I'm also fortunate to have funding from the NIHR Imperial Biomedical Research Centre and Imperial Health Charity to undertake a postdoctoral research fellowship uh, based at the Department of Surgery and Cancer at Imperial College London. I want to say a big thank you to Chris and Sharon and the organising committee for inviting me to be a part of this great event. And I'm just sorry we can't be together. But what I do hope is that what I have to say is particularly relevant for a conference where healthcare professionals, patients and caregivers attend as one to learn more about head and neck cancer. And what I'm going to talk to you today is about the work we've done at the Royal Marsden uh, in partnership with the Point of Care Foundation to engage with our patients, engage with our caregivers and engage with uh, healthcare professionals to co-design the head and neck cancer services that we deliver. And so I hope that uh, you will enjoy this and I very much look forward to the panel discussion. Before I start, I just want to say a thank you to some really important people. First of all, to Gronia Brady, who has been instrumental in the projects that I've worked on within head and neck cancer. Um, and I'll tell you about some exciting work that we're doing as well as the pre presentation goes on. But more widely, I do want to say a big thank you to the Department of Speech, Voice and Swallowing, the head and neck unit and the therapies team at the Royal Marsden NHS Foundation Trust as well as the laryngology service at the National Centre for Airway Reconstruction at Charing Cross Hospital as part of Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. So just to open with this statement, nearly half of Americans believe that the US healthcare system and healthcare providers are not compassionate. And that's a fairly striking statement to start the presentation with. And as we know, that is not isolated to the United States. And many of you here will remember the dreadful uh, issues and incidents that occurred at the Mid Staffordshire NHS Foundation Trust, uh, the public inquiry, which was then subsequently carried out by Robert Francis QC which showed a complete breakdown of care, a complete breakdown of compassion, a complete breakdown of governance with dreadful, dreadful consequences. And it seems inconceivable as a healthcare professional, how could people be in a caring profession and somehow lose their ability to care? Compassionate care requires an understanding of another person's pain, another person's suffering, but not just understanding, a commitment to do something about this, as is highlighted in this, um, how important is compassionate healthcare paper, uh, which compared the perceptions of people in the US and Ireland. Unfortunately, too often, problems in healthcare come to people's attention as a deficit in healthcare organisations. As well as numerous recommendations that came out from the Mid Staffordshire NHS Foundation Trust um, findings, both from the Francis report, but also subsequently um, from the uh, work done by Don Berwick. It was a very interesting outcome in some places. And one of those, and this is some years ago now, was that a specialist team of hospital inspectors should be created and should include patients to identify problems early. And secondly, patient groups should be properly funded and trained to carry out inspections and to be able to bring in external experts. So for all the terrible things that happened as a result of the care issues at Mid Staffordshire, 
This was really an opportunity and a recognition by people that patients are extremely important people, not just because they're consumers of services, but because maybe they have something to offer at another level. On completion of his report, Don Berwick recommended four main guiding principles to build an even better NHS and this concept of a learning NHS. He emphasised what a fantastic institution the National Health Service is and that it is not unique in making mistakes. That is a problem in healthcare worldwide. However, what he did say is that in order to be an exemplar health service, place the quality and safety of patient care above all other aims. And not only does that create a safe environment, it actually enables you to deliver lower cost care if you involve patients. Remember to engage, empower and hear patients and carers throughout the entire system and at all times. Also, when he wrote to the people of England, he said, we have to wholeheartedly foster growth and development of all staff, especially with regard to their ability and opportunity to improve the processes within which they work. And also insist upon and model in our own work, thorough and unequivocal transparency in the service of accountability, trust and the growth of knowledge. And I think this is a really nice way to close his letter to the people, which is was you as patients, as carers and as citizens have a vital and exciting role to play and your voice is key to the future. And he closes by saying, I hope that this report will give you more confidence in speaking up everywhere and all the time in a vital NHS and will give those who care for you and want to help you the confidence and skills to invite you hear you and welcome you into an authentic partnership. What is also particularly heartwarming from his report is the fact that he also took the time to write with clinicians. And when we think about empathy and compassion, I think this couple of paragraphs really sums it up. He doesn't shy away from the fact that things went especially badly at Mid Staffordshire. And it, but what he did was he empathised and showed compassion. Statements like, it gets rough sometimes, doesn't it? Statements like, at its worst, problems like that can hurt morale as people lose sight of how great the mission is and of how hard you are trying to do what's right. And I think that shows a real compassion and understanding reaching out to people, it was a very difficult time going to work every morning with healthcare being scrutinised and everyone being implicated as a healthcare professional into the problems that occurred at Mid Staffordshire. And that was one place. That's not to say, as Don Berwick said, that mistakes don't happen elsewhere and problems don't happen in other centres and other healthcare systems. But certainly, as a healthcare professional at the time, it felt awful because most people are trying to do their very, very best. Here are two books that I'm going to refer to uh, during my talk today, and they kind of mirror what uh, Don Berwick was saying. The first one is an excellent book. It's essentially a systematic review of compassion. It's called Compassionomics, and it certainly had a real impact on me uh, reflecting on the care that I provide and the organisations that I work with. And the second one really mirrors what Don Berwick was saying, which is the patient revolution. And this is written by David Gilbert, who's a mental health um, services user, and makes the very, very compelling argument that maybe patients have the answers to some of the most significant issues in healthcare today. So based on this concept of compassion, how do we move from empathy to compassion? And what are the differences? 
one of the simple things is to just think of empathy as being a feeling. However, compassion is an action. And if we don't have compassion, that can really impact, impact on the connection that we have with the people who use our services. So we need to see what the problem is. We need to feel and understand what the issues are. And we need to be able to respond and develop that personal connection. And what I'd like to talk to you now about is a study that was carried out at Johns Hopkins in the US. And this study looked at the value of a compassionate consultation for people newly diagnosed with cancer. And I'll tell you what the significance of 40 seconds is shortly. When people saw the doctor, they were either given the standard consultation or an enhanced compassionate consultation. And the doctor would say, in addition to the information usually provided, I know that this is a tough experience to go through and I want you to know that I am here with you. Some of the things that I say to you today may be difficult to understand, so I want you to feel comfortable in stopping me if something I say is confusing or does not make sense. We are here together and we will go through this together. And that was further punctuated by a closing sentence, which was, I know that this is a tough time for you. And I want to emphasize that again, that we are in this together. I will be with you each step along the way. The significance of the 40 seconds, it only took 40 seconds to enhance the narrative at that cancer and a consultation and the breaking of the bad news. And what was the further benefit of that? They measured people's anxiety and found that there was significantly less anxiety in those who underwent the enhanced compassion consultation and also rated their oncologists more highly. So when we think about service improvement, what normally triggers service improvement and I did a teaching session on this last week and I can tell you that the first thing that people said was complaints and quite often it is a complaint will come into a service and there will be a knee-jerk response to what do we need to do how do we need to address this and there is a real Yes, there's some learning. Yes, there will maybe be Datix reporting of uh, an error, but a very reactive, potentially, approach. Then, as we've heard from the Francis reports and Don Berwick, we need to really include patients and citizens and caregivers in how we design and deliver care. And I'm sure some of you here may have sat on groups with professionals in a capacity as a member of the public or someone who's used to service and I remember this myself looking around a room full of consultants full of nurses full of therapists all very senior people who'd been involved invited to a meeting and there would be one patient sitting feeling out of their depth and I think a lot of people regardless of whether you're a professional or a, a person who uses services can feel out of depth at some of those meetings but in some way that was seen as we've had patient involvement of course that's not true patient involvement what true patient involvement is is working in partnership with those people giving them a real power base from which to support decision making support planning and I think one of the really outstanding ways that this has been um, particularly highlighted has been through the involvement of patients um, and public uh, in research design and the fact that that is one of the quality indicators and fact that if you do not have decent patient and public involvement in any research study design, that will not get approved by the National Institutes for Health Research. They want to see strong evidence. And that is judged not only by clinicians, not only by academics, but importantly by patients.
So we need to move along that continuum from just responding to complaints to really working closely. And as David Gilbert said, our patients are probably our most underused resource when we are looking at healthcare improvement. Now, some of you may remember this story in the newspaper, this fresco in Borja in Spain. Um, it was decided that the fresco needed to be uh, repaired, needed to be restored. And on the far right, you can see that there were pretty catastrophic consequences for this uh, and doesn't bear any resemblance to the first picture. Now, that means that making changes is, is not always going to make things better. The fact that the tourism in Borja went through the roof as a result of this is another matter altogether. However, when we're thinking about healthcare services, we need to really be careful, really think about what we're doing and think, does this need to be changed? And as someone who works in healthcare services, and I'm sure many people here have been through many healthcare service changes and patients who are here and caregivers who are here will have seen many changes that just don't feel right, don't do what they're supposed to do. So I've been very lucky to train in a, uh, a methodology called experience-based co-design which the technical uh, de definition is, it's a participatory action research approach combining user-centered orientation and a collaborative change process. Basically, it's about us working in partnership to create change. And at the center of that is a partnership with patients. So why do we need patient-centered quality improvement? Well, rather than just completing surveys, which is the most common way that feedback is obtained by healthcare services, it's about understanding the experiences of care. How did it feel? And if we involve and keep patients at the center of what we do, it helps us to deliver care that's more responsive to their values, their needs, and their preferences. And as Don Berwick alluded to, improve safety, effectiveness, and experience. The immediate benefits, and this a lot of this comes from the design literature, um, better ideas, if you involve the people who use the services, high user value. You get an improved understanding of needs when you listen to people's experiences. And if they do have ideas, you can immediately validate them. You can get high quality output and better decision making, reduce development costs, reduce time taken to make those changes and optimal cooperation between participants. And I think what's important is I'm going to illustrate to you, it's not just about participants when we think about inviting patients in, it's that partnership with those people who provide services. And in the longer term benefit, and this is very, very much within design and th about how people design shops, etc. Greater satisfaction and loyalty, increased levels of support, enthusiasm for innovation, for change, and better relationships. A more even playing field between those who provide and those who use specialist services in healthcare. From a healthcare perspective, they're sustainable changes when you co-design. And that's what they found within the literature. You will get a better return on your investment if you involve patients and caregivers. Invariably, positive outcomes come for patients as a result. And they also note sustainable change, not just within the service, but the patients, it's a sustainable change for them. Staff can feel a bit worn down at times and are struggling and there's so much change within healthcare at the moment um, for numerous reasons as you know but what we do know is that this approach can be very motivating for staff as well as engaging for patients and the process can be adapted to different settings and funnily enough although experience based co-design has been uh, used primarily within healthcare I read a paper recently that was um, showed that prisoners being 
coming on parole within the Los Angeles County Jail, they started to look at experience-based go to dying to get the best possible outcomes for people who are returning to life outside of the prison setting. So I'm going to tell you in the last few minutes about our experience at the Marsden of co-design. That's me assessing a swallow. And when people come to see me, the first question I ask is, do you know why you're here to see me? And that's really important because most people who come to see me say, is it my speech? And of course, as many of you here will know, speech is just one thing that speech and language therapists do. Um, and oft, more often there are other issues that we're dealing with um, within the head and neck cancer community. If you're interested in finding out more about this work in detail, this is a paper that Gronia Brady and I uh, published with Joanna Goodridge from the Point of Care Foundation. And the Point of Care Foundation is a really, really fantastic organization that looks some of you may have heard schwartz rounds sweeney projects they're really embedded in quality improvement and keeping patients at the center but also about providing compassionate interventions for healthcare professionals as well and that's really illustrated in schwartz rounds an opportunity for people to reflect in a safe environment Gronia and I were particularly lucky because uh, RM Partners West London Cancer Alliance provided uh, training and funding with the Point of Care Foundation for us to undertake training in experience-based co-design. And if you want to know more about experience-based co-design, the Point of Care Foundation have an excellent website uh, with an experience-based uh, co-design toolkit available there. Um, and as I say, this was really... Uh, made such a significant impact on me in the way in which I lead, but also deliver services uh, in healthcare environments. So when we think about experience-based co-design, we need to remember that experience isn't necessarily the same as satisfaction. It's that getting away from the fact that ticking that you've had good care may not really capture what's happened to people while they've been using healthcare services. What's important is through EBCD that we use experience to gain insights to identify opportunities for improvement of services. And it's about experiences, not about opinions, not about attitudes. And I think that's really important because sometimes people can be quite fearful when they take this type of methodology on about what is it going to unveil. Um, and our experience is that it is nothing but positive. So the way that you start is by setting up a project. You look around, you have any of you, have any healthcare professionals here actually sat in a waiting room to see what it's like for a patient? That is just one example of shadowing and trying to get a feel for what's needed. We then gather staff and we interview them, we audio record them, and get to understand their experiences of providing services. We then go on to meet with patients and video record um, them talking about their experiences. There is then the opportunity for both the staff and the patients to meet separately to understand whether what has been said and talked about is a true representation of the way that they see things. And that's before the staff and the patients are then brought together. And the patients will then, for the first time, sit with the people who provide services for them and watch a video of them providing reflections, an edited video, 30 minutes. And from there, patients and staff and caregivers will then move into groups to work on priorities that they have agreed as one. So what are the priority groups? Then there's a movement to implement those and importantly, a celebration event. And then the process can keep going. You can keep working on co-design groups together. What's very important is that we mustn't forget staff. Patients are at the heart of what we're doing, but we need to get staff involved. And it's with designing experiences, not just systems or processes. And it's really important 
This isn't operating separately. This is about patients, staff, caregivers working alongside each other. We identify touch points. The emphasis is on co-design of services. It's a systematic evaluation of improvements and benefits, and it's all about the aesthetics of how things look, how things feel. We have to engage staff in order to get success because they deliver the services and that's just as important as receiving them. They will also help with project setup. They will help set the scene and inform how the experience is for them at the moment. And they will also help us to establish relationships with patients that maybe we haven't, we don't know that we haven't seen. And engaging patients is really important. And one way that we do that, as I said, is through shadowing, walking in their shoes, sitting in waiting rooms, going to consultations. I know that Chris does a lot of that, going around the country to watch clinicians at work to see how things feel. I don't need to tell people here that head and neck cancer has a devastating effect on speech, voice and swallowing and the impact of that disease and treatment can be have an impact before the treatment starts, during the treatment and after the treatment. In our department in speech therapy, we had designated pre-treatment speech therapy clinics set up in 2013 and we felt we were working to the best practice and using the best evidence available, enabling us to get a baseline assessment, information provision and prophylactic swallowing exercises embedded. But what we found out as well was that people weren't coming to those appointments and when we followed up with them, they were saying, oh, I didn't see why I need to see a speech therapy. No one had mentioned my speech. Some people were just totally overwhelmed coming for the appointments and didn't see the value. And information needs are different. People have different information needs at different time points. And they need to have it in a variety of forms. And this is stuff that I know from uh, work I've done with lung cancer patients and also my team uh, that I work with have found out within the gynecological cancer community. So we wanted to look specifically at the pre-treatment pathway uh, for people undergoing head and neck cancer treatment using radiotherapy. And we wanted to do that in partnership with our patients. To do that, we interviewed seven people, seven patients. We made a video. We interviewed seven staff members. And then we had a staff feedback and a patient feedback session, as I described to you. So what the patients told us was they were really drawn by the professionalism and team working. They said, everyone seems to be pulling in the same direction. They know what they're talking about. They made me feel safe. Staff talked about the, the fact that when they tried to make appointments, they needed to try and make them on the same day so they didn't have extra traveling. People didn't know why they were coming for their appointments. Last experience I had of speech therapy was for a lisp when I was six years old. Also, why do I need to see a speech therapist? I seem to be able to speak okay. And also, it's really important that we recommend that we know that people have a lot of appointments and there were some mixed views on whether appointments should be joint or individual MDT members. But people said it's, you know, it's better to kill two birds with one stone. I know you all work closely together, so it makes sense to see you together. And also it was highlighted here that people had varying information needs. Um, they needed smaller chunks. Maybe good to talk to someone who's been through the treatment. And also what they really liked was that as a team, we seemed to be all pulling together and the same messages were what were coming through to patients and caregivers. And they liked the fact it seemed joined up. We were really interested in exercises and why people did or didn't do them. And people said they found it exercises impossible. Some people said there was no problem and they liked the fact that it helped them focus on something else during their treatment, the routine of them. The summary of the patient priorities was what they really wanted was a central point of contact. They also said someone's got to tell us at the outset what the rationale is for a speech therapy appointment. 
They wanted information in a variety of forms. What they felt very unprepared for was the duration of side effects. And they wanted to know more about that at the outset. One patient said, if I was going to invest money in an investment fund, I'd ask for a, for a um, portfolio. I'd like to read about it. I'd like to learn more in the prospectus about what I might get on my return. When I'm entrusting my life to a hospital, I'd like to have some statistics on survival. I'd like to know more about functional outcomes, which is a really interesting concept. They wanted to know about fine tuning after treatment, about what the things they could do to get themselves back to everyday life. And also, it was articulated that people said, if I do have a recurrence, what are my treatment options? So things that we don't think people are thinking about before their treatment, they are thinking about. Staff said they wanted to have more flexible appointments for patients. They recognised that their, perhaps the rationale for the speech therapy appointment wasn't being articulated and we really needed to get that out there. Possibly the most simple thing that we they thought about was and the patients echoed this is why are you called the speech therapy department when you do speech voice and swallowing and that's what we are now they wanted joint appointments the staff that wasn't mirrored always by patients i hasten to add so again sometimes that might be out of kilter they wanted a variety of forms of information provision available and particularly at the marsden where we have people who come all over the world to be treated that it's available in people in a variety of languages there was also a discussion about whether we could meet some of the patient's needs by having a frequently asked questions sheet core mdt questions that we could agree on to make sure that the information that's being provided is consistent and across the board so what was agreed was that we would move to a more Royal Marsden branded set of information. People didn't want to be searching the internet for information. They wanted to come to the Marsden. And that's work that's ongoing in a variety of areas at the moment. They said that they'd like to have a patient information video. They wanted that variety of information that we needed to work on and a bit more about radiotherapy treatment. And this may res resonate with some of you here, but they also wanted information on timelines. And that's very hard to give, as you know, but they wanted to know roughly, when can I expect to be feeling better after the treatment? When can I expect to go on holiday after the treatment? When can I expect to be back at work after the treatment? Or at what point during the treatment may I struggle? Again, fine tuning of information, and also they wanted a buddy system. And this is something that we hadn't thought about. We do it for people who are undergoing laryngectomy, but they wanted a buddy system and to be able to speak to people who've been having treatment or maybe undergoing treatment at the same time. As I said, the agreed priorities were to try and provide more flexible appointments outside of the clinic structure, get some more information for radiotherapy, have a seamless transfer of care. People were very worried about going to their local services coming from a, a, a specialist centre like the Marsden. Changing the name of the SLT department, that was a priority. And we're also now looking to how can we make our research data more accessible to our patients. So what next? Well, currently we're leading on a project looking at how telehealth services are delivered that was a big change that came in rapidly there wasn't a lot of patient consultation on that covid forced our hand but we are in a position now that we can stop and reflect and look at how those services were delivered and we are utilizing experience-based co-design for that and i actually put it out here to you what do you think you could be doing where patients and clinicians could be working in partnership around delivering high-quality, patient-centred care. People do say that there are uncomfortable truths and they're worried. Everyone's out of their comfort zone initially, but you can see patients grow in stature as they get more confident being with healthcare professionals. And I know from my own work, I feel very much that this is a partnership now. It can feel very uncomfortable listening to practice issues. But it's important if we're to grow and learn and develop, we have to. And also, some of what our patients and caregivers tell us may not fit with national guidance and policies and procedures. And we really need to think about that. And that's about how we deliver those services in the future and develop that guidance in the future. 
And also what I think is a priority may not be what our patients and caregivers think is a priority. And that is the importance of co-designing these services and pathways. And so far, we've not had anyone say, I want to have a parking space right outside the hospital. People are realistic and understand the context of the NHS. In summary, this type of work is a real time for reflection. It's a time of reflection for staff, it's a time of reflection for patients. We learn from each other. Many of the frustrations I've learned are shared, but what this does allow for is an opportunity to make big changes with little resource. And importantly, it's a real opportunity for patients to be users and co-designers of highly specialist services. Thank you. A horse goes into a bar. Bartender looks at him and says, why the long face? Hooray! Hooray! Hello everyone, I'm Jyoti Benjamin, a member of the Academy of Foods and Nutrition and a certified specialist in oncology, currently working at Kaiser Permanente, Bellevue, Washington State. Head and neck cancer patients undergoing treatment need a dietitian by their side on a regular basis if not daily. The nutritional needs of head and neck cancer patients are unique and they correlate to the outcomes short-term as well as long-term. There are numerous studies that support and collaborate the fact that good nutrition during cancer treatments can affect outcomes. Keeping this in mind, early nutrition intervention in head and neck cancer patients is very important. A dietitian can be a very valuable member as a part of the care team and an ally to the patient and the family. Have you ever wondered what happens inside a research laboratory or who the people are who are working on new treatments for head and neck cancer? Join me, Dr. Elaine Emerson, and members of my research team for a special virtual tour of our laboratory. Mucosamine mouthwash and oral spray can be used together to provide a convenient and effective way to help you with the effects of cancer therapy. The mouthwash and oral spray have been proven to reduce the symptoms of dry mouth, provide rapid pain relief and help treat and relieve the symptoms of oral mucositis. Hello, uh, Mike Heffernan here from uh, Dr. Heff's Remarkable Mints. Uh, you may remember uh, Toby and I from uh, the conference last year. I can't believe a year has gone by. Uh, unfortunately, because of social distancing, Toby can't be in the same room. So I thought I'd bring uh, an, another alternative Toby along uh, to wish everybody uh, a great year and hopefully next year we can all get back together again. Bye for now. I was a workaholic, super energetic, fit, healthy, and a really, really happy person. Didn't think for one second that you know cancer would hit me. Everything changed. Every waking moment, you appreciate everything much more. The hospital stay was really, for me, mentally challenging. I just wanted to have some inspiration. And in that environment, it's incredibly hard to find. I haven't spoke to a friend who was having treatment at the Rutherford. I decided to have a look. It doesn't feel like you're coming for cancer. It feels like you're just coming to get well. It's a positive experience rather than I'm having chemotherapy. I'm really excited about my future. My advice for anybody starting their journey would be to surround yourself with positive people and to ask yourself what you want to do and go and do it. Hooray. Head and neck cancer is a brutal treatment. When you take the ability to communicate off somebody and to eat and drink, you stop being a human being. So what we're doing is, courtesy of one of our sponsors from America, we're actually sending patients what we call a boogie board. 
The boogie board is a, is a piece of equipment that the patient can write on it and then push a button and that text disappears. So we'll use this on our head and neck cancer ward for patients with communication difficulties, particularly after surgery, including laryngectomy. So the device allows you to write a message and then move on by deleting it automatically. And that's very useful for patients who can't speak, which is common after head and neck cancer surgery. Communication is very difficult after head and neck cancer surgery and it's frustrating for patients who can't communicate, but, uh, particularly if they've lost the use of their voice. So this kind of device is critical for communicating with family and caregivers and healthcare professionals during their inpatient stay. So the boogie board is a nicer way to communicate with your friends, your partner. It makes it so much easier for the patient to communicate. The Mouth Cancer Foundation and Swallows Head and Neck Cancer Charity have enjoyed a great relationship for many years. We are both passionate about supporting patients and carers every step of the way along their cancer journey. Working together makes us stronger, and when we are stronger, we can better serve everyone affected by the disease. Now Derek's going to talk about the role of the caregiver and how working with healthcare professionals can improve patient outcomes. Derek Luthwaite, one of our volunteers at the Swallows, became a caregiver when his wife was diagnosed with mouth cancer in October 2018. Here Derek tells his story and the role of a caregiver. Hello everyone, my name is Derek and I trust I find you all as well and as safe as can be expected at this very difficult period of time. The coronavirus pandemic has impacted on us all in some way, but without doubt it has made the situation for carers even more difficult. Today I'd like to try and explore with you some personal as well as general experiences and observations which challenge the already difficult role of the carer to the limit and often beyond. Carers in crisis. In the UK currently, one in eight adults care unpaid for family and friends. Carers UK reports that the coronavirus pandemic has led to 70% of these unpaid carers having to provide even more care for their loved ones during the outbreak. One third of which was a result of their local care and support services having been reduced or closed. Many of these selfless individuals will lead extremely complex and busy lives, completely unaware of the potential support available to them from the state, charities and other sources. They may not even know where to start seeking the support they might need. Please try to imagine this scene. It's dark outside because it's only 2.30 in the morning. And on this particular morning, it happens to be raining and cold. I mean, very, very cold. The silence is broken by the ear-shattering tone of a telephone ringing. A slightly unsteady hand fumbles for the source of this intrusion, which has dragged the owner from a very deep and extremely comfortable sleep with heavy eyelids and a quiet but reassuring voice, the call is answered. Hello, Swallows Helpline, how can I help you? 
the response is all too common as a trembling voice replies I need help I don't know what to do anymore I just can't cope Sadly yet another carer has found themselves in a very very dark place and turned to what most would consider a last resort for some comfort and support. Why are approximately 70% of all calls to the Swallows helpline made by carers? The answer to this question are many and varied and are driven by the circumstances and the needs of the individual making the call. What can be said with some certainty is that the carer making this call believes that they have absolutely nowhere else to turn to. That whatever situation they, found, they now find themselves in, all other avenues of help, assistance and guidance have failed. And reaching out to the Swallows helpline is often a final resort from a carer in a state of despair and deep emotional distress. Most carers have not been trained to deal with the demands of a head and neck cancer patient or their needs, whilst at the same time trying to maintain a home environment, work commitments and the unrelenting requirements of the treatment regime from simply travelling most days long distances to the hospital to assisting with personal care such as specialised feeding and in some cases probably the most difficult an inability for even the most basic oral communication All of these issues take a huge toll on a carer's physical and mental well-being. And as much as the patient's normal life is taken over by the focus of fighting their illness, so the carers also find themselves immersed in this same fight. But from an entirely different position. One of not having cancer themselves but the guilt that comes from watching a loved one suffering from the ravages of the cancer the invasive treatment regime and the desperate need to constantly give moral physical and emotional support which is not always acknowledged or welcomed by either patients or healthcare professionals the healthcare system is focused on treating the patient's cancer with the objective of obtaining either a cure or at least long-term remission. And they do a remarkable job in achieving that objective, to which both patients and carers thank them for their dedication and skill. Carers, however, find themselves dealing with the patients 24-7. and dealing with their quality of life issues. And as this is a far less definable objective, impacted by patients' individual attitudes and behaviours, it is sometimes, I might even say often, not recognised as the essential support in the treatment regime that it truly is. The carer becomes both the physical and psychological support mechanism to the patient. And whilst his support is given unquestionably and often unknowingly, it is certainly without adequate professional training and guidance. So it is absolutely no surprise whatsoever that some carers find this role not only difficult, but at times almost impossible to cope with. As a result, carers' physical and mental situations deteriorate to the point where they feel unable to carry on, to the point where they feel unable to be of help, 
or that they must be doing something wrong. And that concern and worry is truly bad for both the patient and the carer. The carer's natural inclination is not to complain. <laughs> they do not have cancer. So they feel they have no real justification to ask for help. They certainly do not want the patient to be aware of the struggle that they're fighting with and would do anything to avoid upsetting or adding to the patient's problems, even if sometimes the patient is the problem. This is a real issue and it does have profound as well as negative effects on the carer. The healthcare system absolutely needs carers performing their role in support of the patient if, for no other reason than there is, realistically, no alternative available. But when a patient's health deteriorates, the system, in the guise of our healthcare staff, leap into action in an attempt to remedy the situation as soon as possible. But when a carer's physical or mental health begins to suffer, there is absolutely nothing in place to come to their aid. The carer, a vital cog in the com complex cancer treatment highway, is not recognised as a patient or a potential patient in their own right and therefore little or no serious treatment is at hand. So, if being able to recognise the situation and not all carers do, is potentially the start to resolving the issue, who do carers turn to? Not all carers have the opportunity to call on friends or family for guidance, help and support. Indeed, the perceived burden of needing to just get on with it often acts as a barrier to seeking essential help. Some carers may not want their immediate family or friends to know that they are not coping with the situation as well as they portray on the outside. And often feel that this new and sometimes overwhelming and frightening carer role that they suddenly find themselves in is entirely their responsibility. I do not want in any way to shift the burden of it onto others, even when something as simple or as basic as being able to take a short break from home or the patient would prove invaluable to both. Friends and family are absolutely fantastic in offering both moral and physical support to carers, always assuming that the carer does have family and friends to turn to. But just like the carers themselves, they are not trained professionals and lack the specialist knowledge of how to care for head and neck cancer patients, just the same as the carer. So at best, their most welcome help and assistance can only be moral, supportive, anecdotal, none of which is able to address the carer's underlying psychological and emotional battles. So turning to the professional medical people that carers will undoubtedly come into contact with as a result of head and neck cancer diagnosis, well, it should offer a rare chance to gain an insight into the impact of an almost overnight becoming a carer and the potential and real effect that it will have on each individual carer's life, physical and mental well-being. All too often, this is a lost opportunity, as both the medical professionals and indeed the carers themselves are totally focused on the patient, their treatment and hopefully a cure plan. The carer wants to be strong and supportive of the patients and often has no idea until it's usually too late, that they are in need of help themselves. In fact, they will often go to great lengths to cover up their own physical 
and mental situation as they strive to do their very best for the real patient, the one with the cancer, not the one who's just being silly. Once again, the attitude of just get on with it often prevails in this situation. How many health professionals during a patient's consultation will turn to a carer and ask, and how are you today? How are you doing? And receive a standard carer's reply of, can you guess? I'm fine, thank you. When in reality, this is blatantly not true. The opportunity to discuss their own issues with the patient's healthcare team seems mm, somewhat self-indulgent. And even if this hurdle is overcome, it is rare, very rare, to get time alone with these professionals to discuss issues that involve the patient without the patient being present. The primary carer is with the patient 24-7 and could tell the healthcare team about issues arising from the patient's treatment, pain management, general attitude and behaviours that the patient somehow manages to hide from their doctors and nurses. But this delicate and sensitive discussion should never be held, never be held in the company of the patient. The overwhelming sense of disloyalty to the patient is a huge barrier and this serves no one well. The burden of keeping this vital information from the medical team or indeed the disloyalty felt by spilling the beans if given the opportunity increase the stress and anxiety levels of the carer to new heights and as most of you probably no. Guilt can and does paralyse action and that serves nobody any well. If matters of confidentiality are an issue, well I would suggest that it cannot be beyond the scope and capabilities of administrators to devise a simple document that both patient and carer can sign, agreeing to full and total disclosure of medical details and treatment to both parties, thereby eliminating one massively unhelpful barrier. The tragedy of these real and perceived barriers is that there is little or no effective help available to carers to guide or assist them in dealing with these at times overwhelming and destructive emotions. Once on the slippery slope of denial and despair, you just seem to accelerate towards the inevitable result, a breakdown of either or both physical and mental well-being, which again serves neither carer nor patient well. Carers can be and often very are very, very resilient, but with early recognition of the symptoms and the correct intervention, the potential for a breakdown could be avoided or at least mitigated. However, I would suggest that it will need a step change in both the treatment regime and the attitude of healthcare professionals towards the primary carers as a genuine source of valuable insight into the patient's behaviour and attitude towards their cancer and also their treatment plan, as well as their, their own needs, ensuring that they are able to continue as an effective carer for the patient. It is genuinely my belief that until head and neck cancer patients and their primary carers are treated together as a combined unit, then the situation will never improve. And that telephone support line, located here where I live in Blackpool, 
will continue to ring in the early hours of too many mornings with too many carers desperately seeking the last resort of assistance. Our current cancer treatment system benefits from many, many trained professionals, from consultants, oncologists, doctors, dentists, nurse specialists, nurses, nutritionists, speech therapists. I mean, the list just goes on and on. But there is one glaring omission. The psychologist. Perhaps the one specialist that could recognise the signs of both a patient and carer's mental health deterioration and help put in place a support network that would enable the carer to continue with their vital contribution to the patient's recovery, as well as helping the carer deal with their own mental health issues. Head and, head and neck cancer diagnosis and treatment is as much a mental battle as it is a physical one and certainly for the carer it is probably the greatest hurdle to overcome as long-term treatment slowly chips away at the carer's resolve the opportunity to talk through issues in a non-threatening environment by which I mean without the patient being present can only increase the chance or chances for the carer to avoid their own health decline and hopefully positively reassess their circumstances, help them gain an inner strength and find a clear way forward, knowing that they have not been abandoned and are not alone. Sadly, and in my opinion quite wrongly, mental health issues always seem to carry a stigma and this perhaps prohibits carers from raising issues with their medical team but it is almost certain that even the strongest of personalities will suffer a decline of some kind during protracted and lengthy cancer treatments and these are often ignored and go untreated. So, this is where the swallows can and does help carers who do step forward. Not, not with a professional diagnosis, but with time, listening, understanding, and helping them to Refocus on themselves. Carers are notoriously bad at only focusing on the patient and not themselves. And this refocus really will help in their task of assisting the patient. Talking to and with other carers who have experienced many of these same emotions and made it through to the other side surely offers hope and a light at the end of the tunnel to carers who feel that they have hit the brick wall of emotional despair. Unfortunately, swallows cannot be present at every consultation of all head and neck cancer diagnosis meetings that take place around the world. And besides, I would actually argue that the need for carer support increases over time and over the course of the treatment and is only ever rarely present in the early stages. Intervention and prevention is always better than treatment. So we need much more serious observation of the carers from our health professionals during routine appointments with the patient. Give them an opportunity to speak privately if they so wish. And above all, learn to recognise the early signs of a carer who really is not coping well with their situation. And don't be afraid to intervene. 
until such a time that regular and organised professional assistance is available to and for carer issues, we at the Swallows will pick up the slack and continue to try to fill the gap. And we therefore urgently ask, nay demand, of all medical professionals in the provision of head and neck cancer treatment to ensure that both patients and carers are made aware of the availability of our support network. Finally, and in conclusion, I would just like to say that in my opinion, it is very, very sad that in this supposedly modern, caring world, we ignore the needs of the very people essential in supporting the recovery of head and neck cancer patients. By focusing almost exclusively on a cure and not on any of the consequences or implications, the effect and effects of a chosen treatment may have on the carers and their ability to positively influence their own and their loved one's quality of life. Which after all, in my opinion, as well as striving for the cure, should be our number one all-inclusive objective. Thank you. I saw a patient the other day. I said, sorry, but you get six months to live. He said, I don't think I could have paid my bill for another 12 months anyway. I looked at his chart, I said, I think you got 12 months to live. Hello, my name is Rebecca Spurn. I'm a dietitian with Northwell Health Department of Radiation Medicine. I work with outpatient oncology patients. I think that it's really important and beneficial for a patient with head and neck cancer to work with a dietitian because in the situation that a cancer patient is in, there are many, many things that are out of your control. But how a person chooses to manage their nutrition and what they eat is something that they can control. And this is something that dietitians can be really helpful with. When I'm working with a cancer patient, my two main focuses are to try to help them manage their symptoms and to also try to help them get the calories and protein and fluids that they need to get through the treatment as strong as possible. And I think that every head and neck cancer patient who is affected so much by their treatment, because of the nature of the treatment, it really affects their ability to eat. And I think that we as dietitians can be so helpful in maximizing a person's ability to get the nutrition they need to be as strong as possible throughout their treatment. In addition, I think that dietitians can be really helpful in teaching healthy eating habits and not the least of which, we can also be very supportive emotionally for all the challenges that patients are encountering. The University of Edinburgh's Centre for Regenerative Medicine would like to take you behind the scenes of our research. Join me, Dr. Elaine Emerson, for a special virtual tour of my laboratory and to find out more about our research into new treatments for patients recovering from radiotherapy. Mucosamine mouthwash is a soothing mouthwash designed to become part of your usual daily dental routine. It's not always practical to carry the mouthwash around with you, so Mucosamine Oral Spray comes in a convenient 30ml bottle with a long nozzle to help you get those hard to reach areas in your mouth for fast targeted relief when and where you need it. Hi, it's one of you to come and say hi, I know it.
Now Mike's gone, I can take that off. Uh, it's Toby from Dr. Hess, just wanted to say hi, and thanks to uh, Sharon and Chris for letting us come and say uh, hello on this virtual conference. Um, sorry we can't be there today, but i really looking forward to next year, so hopefully we can meet each other face to face again. Have a great conference and see you again soon. Cheers then. Hi everybody. My name is Mark Lawler and I'm from Queen's University in Belfast. I'm Scientific Director of DataCan, the UK's health data research hub for cancer. We see data as being a little bit like oil. And just like oil, it needs to flow. And then we can use that data to help us in earlier diagnosis of cancer and in providing better treatments for cancer patients. Despite having no symptoms whatsoever, somebody sits in front of you and says, I'm sorry to tell you, Mr. Colgrove, that you have prostate cancer. I have a routine blood test every year, and then I had the MRI, and that's when they found a P-shaped tumour in me. In fact, it was through you that I found out about proton therapy. The actual treatment with the protons takes less than two minutes aside, and that's quicker than a slice of toast. Seeing the tech and the facilities is all fine and it's smart and it's plush, but that counts for nothing if the people aren't giving you a feeling of security and support. And that's what the Rutherford Centre did so well. Oh, flipping heck. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liam from Flynn Health. We know that most patients undergoing radiotherapy treatment will suffer some kind of skin reaction to this treatment, which is why Flamagel RT is clinically proven to reduce the effects of radiotherapy induced skin reaction. Over 90% of patients say that it soothed the pain and the heat from their reaction with its cooling effect and it reduces the intensity of that red, dry, itchy, irritated skin. And it's easy to apply. It's not sticky or greasy, and it dries on the skin very quickly, allowing you to get dressed and get on with the rest of your day. Next, we have Whitney from Virginia, USA, who's gonna speak about the role of nutrition and dietetics in head and neck cancer. Whitney Christie is a registered dietitian and a board certified specialist in oncology nutrition. Whitney works at the Mary Washington Healthcare Regional Cancer Centre in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Hi, my name is Whitney Christie. I'm a registered dietitian. I'd like to thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to participate in the Swallows Group International Head and Neck Cancer Support Group Conference. I'm very honored to have this privilege. I've been a registered dietitian for 15 years, and I've been working with individuals who have cancer for the majority of that time. And what I wanted to share with you today was the importance that I feel that there is for you to be working with a registered dietitian before, during, or after your cancer treatment. As I mentioned, I've been a registered dietitian for 15 years. Another important thing to mention is that I have my CSO, which means that I'm a certified specialist in oncology. That certification requires that I have 2,000 hours of experience working with individuals with cancer. And it also requires that I have two years of experience in the field as well. Another certification that I have that you'll probably find interesting is that I have my certified nutrition, I am a certified nutrition support clinician. What that means is that I have special experience working with individuals who have feeding tubes or require IV feeding. That also requires that there, you have a certain amount of experience, around two years of experience working with individuals who have feeding tubes or require IV feeding. And it also requires, as does the CSO, that you pass a certification exam. I'm broadcasting to you from the United States of America. I am from Virginia, and I work for a regional cancer center at Mary Washington Healthcare. To describe a little bit about our cancer center, 
we have three radiation facilities. We have one central location, which is a large radiation facility, and then we have two other small satellite centers uh, that are radiation facilities too. We have various, various practices that are outside of the hospital, and then we have practices that are inside of the hospital. Most of our oncologists operate outside of the hospital. And one thing that I appreciate about my job is that my services to patients are free. And that means that there's no barrier to care. What I thought I'd do with my presentation was go over some questions um, that I think can explain to you why I think it's important for you to work with a registered dietitian and maybe some key things that you can ask or the key things you can look for when you're trying to find a registered dietitian. I think having the certification of the certified specialist in oncology is a, is a good thing to look for when you're looking for a registered dietitian. And also, like I said, having a certification in um, tube feedings or TPN, that CNSC certification is also something that you should look for when you're finding a dietitian. Um, and that would be if you do have a feeding tube. And lots of individuals who have head and neck cancer do require feeding tubes. The first question that I'm going to go over is tell us a little bit more about what a registered dietitian does in a cancer center. When might you be involved in caring for individuals who have head and neck cancer? I'm typically involved with caring for individuals who have head and neck cancer at various stages in their journey. I may have individuals with head and neck cancers um, referred to me after they have surgery. They may have feeding tubes and the physician wants me to um, help them with figuring out their feeding tubes and improving or optimizing their nutritional status. Uh, some other ways that I'm involved with individuals with head and neck cancer is that I will see them prior to their treatment. Um, some of you may know that individuals with head and neck cancer often will get um, combined chemotherapy and radiation. I would say that's the largest uh, percentage of patients that I work with who have head and neck cancer, um, where they go through chemotherapy combined with radiation. Sometimes we'll have like a prophylactic feeding tube placed um, and I will follow them through their journey um, a lot of times until they are finished with using their feeding tubes. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I'm, I'm involved. And then I also, um, other than head and neck cancer, I do see a lot of individuals that have other forms of cancer. Um, just to give you some statistics on how much head and neck cancer I see, about 20% of the patients that I work with have head and neck cancer. So that's a large portion. Um, and I would say the frequency that I work with individuals who have head and neck cancer, um, it's quite frequent. I do try to see these individuals every week or every other week during their treatment, um, sometimes a little bit more frequently than others, depending on how they're doing and how their nutritional status is. The next question is when you see an individual with head and neck cancer, initially, what ty type of things do you talk about? Typically, when I see an individual with head and neck cancer for the first time, I like to talk, I like to do what's called a nutrition assessment. Well, I will talk to the patient about how they're doing nutritionally, what type of barriers they might be having with their nutritional status, uh, if they're having any issues with swallowing or things that might hinder their nutritional status. Um, and I, we typically go over those type of things. And like I said, just see if there's any um, anything that I might be able to help them with in terms of nutrition. I also like to review with them some upcoming things to think about with their treatment that's coming up. Um, so I may review side effects to anticipate so that they will have some nutrition survival skills uh, that, they, that they're that they able to refer to. Um, but then again, I, I do remind them that I, that I will follow them throughout their cancer journey. Another thing uh, that, I, that I like to do is ask them about questions that they might have, anything that they've heard or any um, myths that I might need to bust as far as nutrition goes, because um, there's a lot of information out there and I just, want, I just want to make them comfortable and make sure that they have all of the information that they, that they need or questions answered that they might have about nutrition. For those who are getting feeding tubes placed, are there any special consideration for these individuals? Why is it important to collaborate with a dietitian if you have a feeding tube? I think it's important to collaborate with a dietitian uh, if you have a feeding tube because 
they can help you troubleshoot and figure out um, the best regimen that you need to be on. Sometimes formulas, um, not all that work for one individual would work for another individual. And using a feeding tube is a huge part of a lot of people's journeys who have had neck cancer and it can be quite life-changing. So I think it's important um, that, that they collaborate with a dietitian. And if that dietitian can't figure out answers, if there's any mechanical issues or things where they might need somebody else to look at their feeding tube, um, the dietitian typically can lead you in the right direction as far as finding somebody who can help you. So, but I think, I think a dietitian is a good starting point as far as, um, you know, getting information about your feedings and how to do the, them. And then if you have any questions or having any issues with your feedings, um, a lot of times I'll have people that really struggle with getting in like adequate nutrition during treatment just because of a lot of side effects that they have from their cancer treatment. So I try to talk to them about, you know, adjustments that they might need to make with their feedings. Um, and answer any questions or issues that they might be having. The next question that I have up here is about caregivers. Tell us about the importance of a caregiver or loved one's participation in head and neck cancer treatment and how this is reflected in your role. I think caregivers are extremely important during treatment for head and neck cancer. A lot of times because of the grueling nature of the treatment. Um, it's a very difficult treatment for, for patients to go through. Um, a lot of times they may not feel up to doing all the things like doing their feedings or you know getting their hydration in that they need to or getting an adequate diet or variety in their diet. So a lot of times I'm working with caregivers. Um, they provide a little bit more information sometimes. Um, they a lot of times are the primary one that's taking care of fixing the meals or doing the nutrition or the tube feedings that the patient may have. Um, so I find the caregiver's role extremely important um, in getting that individual through treatment. The next question is tell us about your approach to care with an individual with head and neck cancer. My approach to care is individualized. And when I say that, I mean that each of us has unique needs, especially when it comes to nutrition. So I think it's important to meet the patient or the individual where they are and try to find out um, how you can best facilitate them getting through their cancer journey or their cancer treatments um, the way that they want to get through their cancer treatment. Um, in terms of diet, um, diet modifications or even talking about um, different things that they might need to do with their current diet. So I think focusing on kind of what that person does normally in terms of nutrition and then kind of making adjustments from there. Um, as I said before, we're all unique, um, especially when it comes to nutrition. So I think that everybody has unique nutritional needs um, and that's something that a dietitian uh, has experience with addressing. The next question is what are some ways other than direct counseling with an individual with head and neck cancer that you are involved in their care? There's actually a lot of ways, a lot of behind the scenes things that you might not know that, that registered dietitians are involved in. Um, direct care probably takes about 75% of my time, uh, but the other portion of my time uh, can be filled with meetings. Um, I do a lot of multidisciplinary meetings. Uh, we have uh, what we call cancer conferences, and we have one specific to head and neck cancer where we will actually talk about patients that are getting ready to go through cancer treatment um, or those who are kind of in the midst of their cancer treatment and address any needs that they might need, um, not only from a nutritional standpoint, but perhaps from a medical oncology standpoint, um, perhaps from a financial standpoint, um, or any other assistance that they might require. Another thing that I've done, and you can see on this slide, is um, I love research. That's, that was another reason that I got into nutrition. Uh, a few years back, I did a research project with um, some head, it was a retrospective research project where I, uh, I actually looked at weight changes and feeding tube use during treatment for individuals who had head and neck cancer. And I was able to present that at a, um, a conference here in the United States of America um, about two years ago. And then I also um, have helped organize uh, our support group 
or had a neck cancer support group. I helped with organizing that. And each year we actually participate in uh, Battling Cancer 5K where the, uh, the funds that are, that are, um, the funds that are uh, generated from that, that 5K go to um, supporting individuals in our community that have uh, cancer. And we formed a, uh, a group that keeps growing and growing. Um, and it's our head and neck cancer support group. And we walk and run um, and show our support and bring awareness uh, to head and neck cancer. The next question is, are there any special nutritional products someone with head and neck cancer might need to purchase prior to starting treatment or can they use things at their home? You can definitely use things at your home. Um, you may need to purchase some things. However, um, you know, a registered dietitian might be able to give you kind of a list of things. A lot of times I'll give a list of things out about things that might be softer um, if, they, if you do have any pain or difficulty with swallowing during your treatment. Um, I also like to talk about smoothies and protein shakes. Um, you can make smoothies just with your own homemade ingredients. Um, there are, are also commercial products that you can purchase. Um, so you can kind of do a combination of both, um, but if you just want to use things in your home, we can talk about that kind of stuff too. Um, so there's not necessarily any special products that you have to use or you have to purchase, um, but there are products um, that might be a little bit more beneficial um, and a registered dietitian can definitely give you guidance on those products um, and things that can help you um, with some of the side effects that you might experience during your treatment. And has COVID-19 changed the way that I deliver care to my patients with head and neck cancer? It really has. Um, since COVID-19 has started, I'm actually doing telemedicine. So I've been doing virtual visits with my patients. Um, I'm doing either video sessions or I'm doing telephone sessions with my patients. Um, so, so that's been how, how COVID-19 has changed the way that I provide care. Um, and so far, so good. I haven't had really any hiccups or anything like that. Um, I think that my experience probably has helped with that um, in reaching out to patients um, and just kind of knowing what to expect with patients during their treatment. Um, so uh, a lot of challenges for a lot of people in the medical profession, um, but that's been my biggest challenge um, is that I have transitioned to, from before what was more in-person care to doing more telemedicine. Talk to us about your experience, about support groups and your experience with those and how nutrition can be a topic of conversation at these meetings. I love talking at support groups. Um, one thing that with our head and neck cancer support group that I've found is a lot of people in that support group talk about their nutrition and different things that worked for them, different things that might not have worked for them. Um, we always talk about how everybody's, you know, unique again. Um, and some things that may have worked for one person may not work for another person. However, um, I think it's great that people provide their experience and, you know, will provide information on, you know, this worked for me. This might be something that you want to try during your treatment. Um, so I think support groups are great again. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, patients can get a lot of useful information um, in attending a support group uh, meeting. Can you talk more about some of the common side effects of combined chemo radiation and how nutrition can help manage the, these side effects? Um, up here I do have a little statistic I, I pulled out. One in three patients has side effects from cancer treatment that they wish they knew more about. I talk about a lot of different side effects that can happen during treatment. And if you've been through treatment for head and neck cancer, you know that there's a lot of different side effects, not just painful swallowing that can happen. You can have changes in your taste, changes in your smell. Uh, you can have issues with nausea. You can have changes in your bowels. Those are all things that I typically will talk to patients about. Um, another thing that I have up here is um, taste and smell changes, um, dry mouth or thick saliva. Um, as some of you probably know going through treatment, um, thick saliva a lot of times can kind of um, follow you near, if you're going through radiation and chemotherapy treatments, a lot of times it kind of happens near the mid to end of your treatment. Um, and dry mouth is one of those things that can kind of happen during your treatments and then even follow you for the rest of your life. Um, so there are a lot of different um, counseling things that I do with patients where I would provide, um, you know, 
verbal communication of the information, but I also provide a lot of um, nutritional informational sheets that review different side effects you might have, like you know, difficulty swallowing, taste changes, um, ways to manage dry mouth and thick saliva. The next question I have here is, how does someone know when it's appropriate to contact a dietitian? Um, and that question, the answer to that is that it's appropriate anytime to contact a dietitian. A registered dietitian, um, like I said, can help you before, during, and after treatment. Uh, if you're interested in speaking with a registered dietitian, you may want to talk to your oncologist, you may want to talk to your radiation oncologist, um, or other individuals who are involved in your cancer care. Uh, registered dietitians are extremely common and extremely important during head and neck cancer treatment because of, again, the grueling side effects that things like surgery, things like chemotherapy, things like radiation um, can do to your ability to eat. So having somebody who has knowledge in that can definitely help um, and give you, you know, things you, that you might not have thought about. So um, I would ask, like I said, any of your medical Providers about if there's a dietitian that you can speak to, um, and preferably if there's one that has certain certifications um, that are relevant to oncology and also ones that might be relevant, relevant to if you have a feeding tube. Tell us about some nutritional issues individuals may struggle with after they complete their treatment for head and neck cancer and how a dietitian can help. So as people near the end of their treatment, particularly uh, chemotherapy and radiation, that's the one that I most commonly see individuals um, go through. A lot of times the treatment ends and the side effects might not end. Um, and the, the support also isn't as much there because you're not going to daily radiation treatments, you're not going to regular chemotherapy um, appointments, and um, you also might not be going and getting your hydration as frequently as you were before. Um, so that being said, some of the nutritional issues that I commonly see are there's, there's still issues with um, tube feedings if people are requiring those during treatment um, there, and, and the need for support for those individuals who have feeding tubes. Um, and then there's also, I think, just the, the need for support in general, um, you know, having all these people surround you during your treatment and then finishing treatment and realizing that some of those people aren't there, like I said, on a daily basis. Um, so those are some of the common issues, I would say, nutritional issues that I see. Um, so I, I typically give follow-up nutritional phone calls after patients finish treatment, um, and we talk about any nutritional issues that they might be having. Because as you know, um, when you finish your cancer treatment, uh, the side effects just don't go away the day that you finish your cancer treatment. They can be that sometimes, sometimes something that lingers um, for a while and sometimes even um, like with dry mouth, uh, something that can last um, for the duration of your life. Is there a certain diet that individuals with head and neck cancer should be striving to get back to after their cancer treatment? Um, this is kind of a loaded question and the reason I put this one here is because um, I do really try to encourage people to um, get more towards what I call a survivorship diet. Um, that being said, I understand that there's a lot of challenges with individuals who have head and neck cancer. Um, for one, you might be relying on a feeding tube. You may have um, formula that you're feeding to yourself. Um, so kind of, you know, ev take everything with stride. Um, I know that with, um, you know, getting back into kind of the groove of eating, a lot of times people do require smoothies, nutritional shakes, um, but it's important also to talk to people about about getting to, into that survivorship mode. And for survivorship, we want you to have, you know, a balanced diet. We want you to, you know, get back into, you know, eating fruits and vegetables. Um, typically the about two and a half cups of fruits and vegetables is what's recommended for um, survivorship guidelines. Um, and we also want you to, you know, get back into eating a healthy diet with like whole grains, um, lean protein, beans, and again, getting all those colors of the rainbow in there, I always talk about antioxidants and phytochemicals and all those fun things that are found in foods. Um, and it's important to try to incorporate those things back into your diet because diet really is important in terms of feeling like your best self and then also um, in terms of kind of getting into survivorship mode. 
Uh, for those who might have feeding tubes, one thing that I would say to you um, that you might want to do um, is to find a registered dietitian if you're kind of tired of being on formula. Um, there are uh, ways that you can blenderize um, your diet um, and incorporate more fruits and vegetables. Um, and that would be something that you could speak to a registered dietitian about. And I am going to end right there. And I just wanted to say thank you again for allowing me the opportunity to do this talk. And I hope that you have a wonderful conference. And I'll see you at the Q&A session. I saw a patient the other day for hearing loss. He said, Doc, my right ear is blocked. I looked in, I said, no wonder it's blocked. You have a rectal suppository in your ear. He said, uh-oh, now I know where my hearing aid is. Thank you, everybody. That concludes our first session. And we can now go live to Boston, USA, and to Arthur Loretano, a medical director, head and neck surgeon, and a Swallows International patron. Arthur is the chair of the panel and is looking forward to hosting the question and answer session. Thank you for everyone for the morning session. I hope you've really enjoyed it. Uh, the comments have been great. We've got a lot of questions. We'll not be able to get through them all today, but I'm now going to hand over to um, Arthur and obviously Ian, and he will uh, take it from here. Over to you, Arthur. A lovely background, by the way. Well, thank you. This is my <laughs> new apartment. So good afternoon, all. Uh, it is the morning here, and uh, I got up at 4 a.m. so that I would be ready for the conference. Uh, you've seen me as the comic relief, but the reality is that uh, obviously this is quite a serious topic, and Chris and Sharon have done a wonderful job, and thank you, Ian, for being the president of the conference this year. Um, it's not by any accident that when you look at who we had as presenters this morning, we had uh, obviously a, a patient and Emma, we've had uh, a care in terms of Derek. And then when you think about it, we've had Kylie, who is our patient navigator from my own clinic, for our own clinic, but also a dietitian. Whitney, who is a, a dietitian nutritionist and Justin talking about dysphagia. We've had nobody really talking about ways of treatment or cure you know, for the actual cancer. And the importance of that is we almost call that table stakes. We expect that we're going to go in and try to cure these cancers. That is our goal from a treatment standpoint. But what's so much more important now in many respects is survivorship and quality of life. Because to cure a cancer but leave somebody with a horrible quality of life is still a tremendous disservice. And so that's why when you look at the people who are on this panel right now, it's really going beyond what, you know, just saying, hey, we cured your cancer. It is moving on to how do we make your life better? So, you know, this is sort of a focus I want to talk about this morning or, or have our presenters talk about. Um, obviously, we're talking about collaboration. That is the big one. And Chris is sending me questions here that have come up. So the first one that came up is for you, Kylie. Uh, first of all, someone mentioned that you were a twit. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, somebody <laughs> wants to know what your Twitter handle is. And oh, um, so I'm not sure if you have uh, a one. Let me see. I forget. I can't um, remember. I do there have a Twitter. Hi. Um, yes, my Twitter handle is that that does that mean my Twitter name? Yeah, you're at. Okay, hold on. Uh, it's awesome. at KKJ5. At KKJ5. Yes. All right. That's me. So while you're on the air here, the question that came to you is uh, Do you do this role alone? Are you the only navigator on your team or do you share the role? Um, so I'm the only navigator on the team, um, and it's worked out great. I would, wouldn't say I'm the only one that assists. I mean, between we have a multidisciplinary team, which uh, includes Dr. Loretano here, um, and also, you know, the radiation oncologist and the speech therapist and the nursing. So we really do work as a, you know, cohesive team, um, but I am the only navigator, um, and it's, I've been in this role for about two years. Okay. And um, what's your typical caseload? Um, say how many patients you're carrying. Okay. Good question. So I, 
Um, similar to what Whitney mentioned, I also see other patients in the clinic as well. So caseload, as far as head and neck cancer patients go, I would say it's now becoming more than 50% of my time um, and anywhere between um, 10 to 15 patients for as far as head and neck cancer goes at a time, whether that be on treatment patients or post treatment patients, um, and then some that haven't started yet. And then the rest of the time would be um, going through the chemo and radiation for other sites of, of cancer. Great, thanks. Um, a lot of what I've gotten are comments, you know, very positive ones, obviously, about uh, everybody's presentation. And um, Chris, if you have more, you can even just put them in the chat and I'll look here. Um, I did have a few questions, uh, certainly for Emma and Derek. Um, and I'll start with you, Emma. One of my questions was we talk about collaboration here. And I'd like to know, like, did you feel that you had a coordinated point of care and journey through your cancer or were you doing multiple visits with multiple different people separately? And I, and I focus on this because of the multidisciplinary approach that I know I brought to Lowell from when I was at the Dana-Farber where I was on staff. Uh, we really did multidisciplinary way back in the early 90s. So Emma, I'll start with you. Um, I felt my, um, my treatments and my whole experience of being treated was very joined up. I mean, I felt very much that there was a collaboration amongst the MDT. I wasn't witness to that collaboration in that I didn't meet them all at the same time. Um, I would, you know, I would see my surgeon and then as I moved through treatment and went to radiotherapy, I would see my oncologist, um, a clinical oncologist here in the UK with a radiotherapy up her sleeve, unlike the medical oncologist who doesn't. But um, I guess my primary um, uh, point of contact really was the CNS, was the nurse. Um, she was the person, and, and I did see a dietitian, and I, and I saw a speech and language therapist, and they were all absolutely amazing at helping me through different stages of my treatment and recovery. I guess the, the most um, consistent interaction I have probably was with, was with the nurse, was with the CNS. Okay. Is that is Derek on? I'm sorry. I don't see him on my list. Yeah, I'm here. He's ah, there. there you are. Okay, thank you. Derek, your thoughts on that as, as you and your family, as you and your wife went through this? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, sadly, um, my experience was completely the opposite uh, to Emma's. Absolutely zero coordination uh, whatsoever. Uh, often we would... Um, we would have an appointment with one department in the hospital at uh, 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and they would make a, a scan appointment or a blood test appointment some seven hours later in the same building at the opposite end of the, you know, they just wouldn't coordinate anything. So your entire day was written off. Often we had appointments uh, in a department uh, on a Wednesday morning, and we'd have to go back to the exact same department uh, the cell, the following day for an appointment with somebody else in, in the same department. There was just zero coordination. And that puts a huge amount of stress, not only on the patient, but the carer. I drove hundreds of thousands of miles up and down uh, uh, the motorway. Uh, I have to say, Arthur, that uh, we were a little unique in that um, we live in one health authority district and we're treated in another and there was zero communication between the two hospitals and the two districts. Um, letters only were the means of communication. In this modern world of Zoom and technology, and it was letter. Uh, um, so, so there was no coordination. And, and it all came to a head at the very end. The last insult for this lack of coordination was a letter from the oncologist at the hospital arrived at my home four weeks after my wife had passed away to tell me, what treatment he was proposing. Ugh. I mean, absolutely outrageous. Um, but what can you do? Um, you know, we're stuck with what we've got. Uh, so this this um, job that uh, Kylie does, I mean, I would walk a million miles to get a taste of some of that. Uh, if, thankfully, and never have to go through this again. But if we had at the time, it would have made life so much less stressful. I mean, hugely less stressful. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really helpful. Thanks, Derek. And I'm just going to give a quick shout out to Kylie. Kylie came to me and said, I learned about this navigator role um, from a conference she had attended and brought me a slideshow. And it was the, specifically the role of the nutritionist slash dietitian becoming the navigator. And uh, 
I was impressed, went to bat for her, talked to the administration and, uh, and she's just nailed the position. So yes, it is definitely something to encourage. Uh, so Ian, let me uh, ask your comments as, as a, uh, you know, obviously in your position as someone who provides excellent care, um, what has been your approach to try to bridge this gap that in particular Derek is really talking about? Yeah, I mean, that's not been a great experience, obviously, for, for Derek, but um, um, we're in the UK, we tend to rely on the clinical nurse specialist, the CNS that we just heard about there. Uh, but the, the practicalities of organizing complex multidisciplinary care in, a, in generally in the UK in a general hospital means that there are multiple administrations involved. So the administration department of the CT scanner, for example, uh, doesn't speak directly to that of the PET scanner or the dental institute and so on. Um, so we try to use, we don't call them a navigator, but we try to use the clinical nurse specialist role as someone who can help not only be a source of information for patients and support, but also to try and smooth their journey some, to some degree. But it's a, I think we're somewhat limited by the fact that we're, we don't tend to provide, we don't run a, a cancer, uh, most places aren't cancer units. They're cancer units within a general hospital that has other pressures. And that makes it more difficult for scheduling as, as Eric was saying, that there are often appointments that conflict or are uh, other uh, different ends of the, the, uh, the day, which make traveling and waiting and hanging around more difficult. And that is a practical difficulty within the NHS, I'm afraid. Okay, thanks. I want to shift gears a little bit, and I'm going to put uh, Justin and Whitney on the spot, kind of going around the, around the horn here, as we say in baseball terms, not cricket, but baseball. Um, so here's one of my questions, which is that, uh, you know, we, we heard a lot about G-tube feedings, patients who definitely are on, um, you know, G-tube feedings. Uh, we often start them early in the process when we know there's going to be dysphagia. So Justin and then Whitney, can you speak about the need to have patients continue to swallow in spite of the fact that they are getting, you know, assuming they're not aspirating and it is safe for them to swallow, uh, the role of their continuing to swallow in spite of the fact that they're really getting all the nutrition through the G-tube. So Justin first, please. Sure. Well, there's, um, <clears throat> there's, there's evidence to say, and certainly uh, our practice at the Marsden is that we actively promote swallowing from baseline. Um, so when people arrive, we, we, we really do reinforce the fact that swallowing throughout keeping that natural movement of the swallowing muscles is so critical. We um, also, we do provide prophylactic or protective swallowing exercises, which is in keeping with a lot of centers in the UK, but also uh, in the US and worldwide. And, and this is really, uh, we also, I would say, we have a reactive tube feeding approach. So people don't automatically have gastrostomies in our center at Marsden. We certainly, as you say, there may be on a case-by-case -case basis where people at the outset may need to have, be, have a tube um, to support them with their nutrition, which is also vitally important. However, we tend to go with a reactive nasogastric feeding approach. I think the thing that we recognize, and I don't have to tell people who are here at the conference, is when you're going through radiotherapy, swallowing and swallowing exercises can be uh, uncomfortable. But we work very closely in partnership with our dietetic colleagues, but also with our nurse specialists and doctors to make sure we optimize pain management so that we can keep people swallowing for as long as possible and ideally throughout treatment. And we have a very hands-on approach with our uh, people who use our services and um, we do keep tube feeding to the bare minimum and it tends to be a reactive NG tube in the... Uh, <coughs> What we do find is the people who do keep swallowing, um, they tend to get back to eating and drinking uh, more quickly. Um, and also, it, it's just, I think it's important for people as well. I think there's you know, many years ago, it might have been said, don't worry if you don't eat and drink, we'll, we'll get you back to eating and drinking after your treatment. And what we've learned now, uh, many years later, is that wasn't necessarily the right approach. And it was uh, vitally important to keep our radiotherapy patients eating and drinking. And we also, with our surgical patients, get people swallowing as soon as possible after surgery because that's equally important. Whitney, your thoughts? Sure, yeah, at our facility, uh, what we do is we 
do similar to what Justin was saying that they do. We have um, what we call prehab, where a patient will go and see a speech therapist. Um, I try to, I saw somebody's presentation about, you know, patients saying, why well, don't have issues with speech, but we try, um, we've actually made a handout for the patients about the importance of speech therapy um, or swallowing exercises and getting patients to continue to eat um, successfully and safely during treatment. Um, the other issue is um, after treatment, if they continue to use those muscles, I mean, they, they do get back to eating a little bit quicker. Um, so unless there's any unsafe reason for a patient to not be eating, I do encourage all of my patients to continue to use those, um, you know, use those muscles, uh, continue to exercise them. Um, and to continue to eat as well as you can during treatment, whether it just be, you know, taking sips of water. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see. So I had one other, quite well, a couple of other questions, but then one question did come in for Emma. So let's jump to that, which is, Emma, how can we drive more collaboration between charities to drive a single voice for change? and then extend that to all speakers too, but Emma. Um, well, there are a num there are some umbrella charities out there. There are, for example, for rare cancers. And I think, you know, this conference is a really excellent example of charity collaboration. I mean, I'm, I'm a charity, Chris is a charity, and here we are together. And I think it's just through being open-minded and, you know, willing to think out of the box and think how you can support each other and, you know, join hands to move things forward together. But I think that we need to um, ensure that we're keeping everybody that's involved in the process of being diagnosed and treated and rehabilitated after treatment of cancer, especially obviously here, has a neck cancer. We need to keep everybody that's involved in the loop and we all need to be working together. I, I'm, I'm very much a believer that, um, as you would have gathered from my talk, that um, you know, patients and clinicians working together um, move things forward. Um, with, you know, as a greater speed um, than, you know, us being siloed um, groups. I don't know if anyone else would agree with me, hopefully. Yeah. Derek, did you have any thoughts on that as a carer? It's a difficult one for me to answer that because obviously I'm uh, very local based in, in uh, the activity that, uh, that, that I do, although I live only down the road from Chris, which is too close by far, as I'm sure you would agree. Um, it's um, all my activity is done is done locally. I, I do manage to get um, through another society that I belong to. I do manage to get other local cancer charities to come and talk to uh, the group that I belong to, not necessarily to the Swallows meeting. And maybe that's something we ought to look at uh, more uh, uh, when when COVID hopefully goes away and we can have our live meetings again, we can look at inviting more uh, cancer support and carer support charities uh, that have a, um, a base locally to come to our meetings, maybe hopefully establish some good long-term working collaborative uh, relationships, which sadly don't always exist at the moment, but open and willing <laughs> very much any other thoughts from the other panelists on that i, I will mention in terms of oh i'm sorry go ahead justin no, i was just going to say i think sort of uh, and uh, emma alluded to this in her talk as well you know uh, you know the, this is the important of collaboration and making sure i think as well for the research hat on making sure that the research that we're doing and the innovation that we're looking to is relevant and important and not just driven by what clinicians think, but what do the people who use the services think, what do the caregivers think, what's important, and uh, always keeping, making sure that our research, the ways we work together are uh, absolutely on point and relevant for people. Um, so that's, you know, thanks, Justin. That is a um, great segue to what I wanted to ask next, because it, it's really talking about, you know, like you said, not just doing with the clinicians, but with the patients. Uh, I did want to make one quick comment before we move to that, which is that in the United States, uh, this is something that was impressive. Awesome. Oh, yes. Um, so that's, you know, thanks, Justin. That is a um, 
great segue to what I wanted to ask next because of just really talking about you know, like you said, not just doing the clinician. Me and myself on the way uh, that we move to that, which is that in the United States, uh, this is something that always impresses me. Oh, yes. Before you go on, Arthur, what I'd like to say is that um, I honestly believe that collaboration is one of the most important things that we can work on to get universal change with government. And without just bear, oh, yeah. before you go on, what I'd like to say. Sorry, I was getting. Oh, ignore me. Just to pick up on Chris's point, I think I, I, I anticipate he was going to talk about how the collaborative voice across all of us is um, is is uh, can be uh, an instrument for change, and how. Um, we must continue to collaborate and, and produce a stronger voice if we want to make meaningful impact. That sounds great, Emma. Thanks. Um, and I agree. I think, and, and, you know, I think it's interesting when you find out some of the charities that exist, trying to bring them together. Um, I also think an area to look for charities is, is how to reach out to where the needs are. So one of the things I was going to say was that in the United States, um, it, particularly in the Boston area, we have a terrible time paying for dental care and for uh, tube feeds, and, and I can let Kylie address that. So Kylie, why don't you tell them how the fact is that our insurance doesn't cover dental care or in many cases tube feeds and how we have to use TeamWalk to pay for that. We have to use charity funds to pay for that. Yeah, um, it becomes a challenge. You know, I really kind of delved into insurance lately. It's just part of my role and I've had no experience with that prior. Um, and the reality is people aren't meeting deductibles or certain things aren't covered or certain patients come in and they haven't applied for certain um, brackets or um, different groups for Medicare, things like that. So it ends up being a real challenge where these people need to start sometimes urgently on tube feedings, um, or sometimes even IV nutrition, um, and there's no option for them. So we have um, a ch our charity, Team Walk, raises money every year. Typically, it would be a walk, and people raise money. This year, it was a walk on your own because of COVID. Um, and every year, we raise money for our patients to pay for things like this. So um, this just this year, I got um, Team Walk to pay for a tube feeding pump for a patient that, um, like I mentioned before, had insurance issues, didn't apply for a specific type of insurance that didn't cover it. So I was able to give him um, a, a tube feeding pump and then supply his formula. Same thing with the dental um, in, insurance. Um, if patients don't have any, or if there's lack of coverage in certain areas, and we do need dental clearance, um, as I'm sure many of you may know, um, we all of our patients need to be cleared by dental in order to move ahead with radiation in most cases. Um, and then often we'll pay for their visits um, with a local dentist that we have a, a strong relationship with. Um, so it becomes amazingly helpful as far as, you know, providing for the patients. And it's also just been a challenge, these obstacles with, with insurance. Luckily we do have two social workers here that are a tag team and we work together um, and they are, pretty much experts. So I have them to lean on to just guide me in the right direction. But it's been amazing with charity um, funds to be able to provide for these patients. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any options. Thanks. And just for a quick uh, primer, dental care is not generally covered in the United States by our medical insurance. Uh, dentists typically want cash. Um, uh, a copay is when a patient has to pay a certain percentage of the payment for their visit. And a deductible means that when you have insurance and you have a $5,000 deductible, the first $5,000 of um, coverage or, or payment for care has to come out of your pocket before the insurance starts to pay. So very different than the NHS. Yeah. Uh, so this next one is going to be for uh, everybody, but I want to start with Emma and um, Derek and first Emma. So one of the things that I'm really big on, and Kylie has heard about this, is preparing patients for what to expect during treatment. Um, when my patients leave the room, they know every side effect of the surgery I'm going to do. Um, typically, when I meet them in the holding area, the pre-op area before surgery, and start talking to them again about the side effects so they know, they, they pretty much rattle them back off to me. Oh, yeah, you told me that. You told me that. You told me that. Because I think preparation is key. 
Emma, mean, when you went through your treatments, um, and then, you know, Derek, I want to hear from you in terms of your wife. Did you feel that you were well prepared for the side effects that you had or anything? And, and then, you know, how could it have been done differently if you weren't? Um, I, I'm going to answer probably a little bit more generally um, rather than just my experience, but talk more broadly sure. about some of the experience of being diagnosed with a very rare cancer with limited treatment options, which is that you don't necessarily, um, you don't feel that you have all the information because there's only a limited amount of information. So, for example, in terms of treatment options, first off, there are only, um, you know, there aren't chemotherapy treatments uh, that are, um, that, that work and there are, um, there are a couple of trials, but there aren't any targeted drug treatments. So, um, and the um, the side effects of um, radiotherapy, um, I I think, are generally explained very well and are known well. You know, in different areas of the head and neck region produce certain well-known and well-documented side effects. I think the problem with surgery with rare cancers, and especially when they're sort of in there, um, and you can correct me when I get this wrong, but sometimes you don't know exactly how large the surgery will be. Of course, you have scans to guide you, but it may be that there, a little bit more surgery is needed. And I think that if you're going in for an extensive surgery, although you may hope that you may come out, you know, for example, with your eye, um, sometimes uh, you, that's not the case. So I think, yes, um, I I think that um, patients that have been diagnosed with adenoid cystic carcinoma in the UK, um, because uh, the surgeries and the radiotherapies are, you know, known to a certain degree, I think there's probably generally quite a good level of preparedness. But in terms of overall, the treatment for your cancer, how it's going to affect you, what it might look like and how it's going to affect you afterwards, no, and that's a challenge, I think, with uh, a lot of rare cancers and rare diseases. Derek, your thoughts on the preparation aspects of things? Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, from a, an observer point of view, um, the uh, treatment plan was was laid out uh, very early on from, uh, from diagnosis uh, in terms of there was going to be extensive surgery uh, followed by uh, radiotherapy. Now, we never got to the radiotherapy because the cancer came back. Um, but the, the description of the surgery by uh, the surgeon that was going to do the operation, but in the end didn't, we had to have a, another surgeon do it, um, involved removing the whole of the lower right-hand side of my wife's jaw. She lost 85, 90% of her teeth. Um, she had to have a bone uh, leg um, bone removed from a leg to do the, the rebuild. And whilst that is being described to you, um, I, a, I don't think she took it in fully because it was shocking. I was a little bit more remote and, uh, and I was the one that asked all the uh, awkward and difficult questions. Um, and we talked about it afterwards, but Jane, until the operation had been completed and she was in recovery when she said she wished she'd never had it done. Now that's, you know, the alternative to that was you will die. Sadly, that happened anyway, but but the alternative to that was you will die if you don't have it done. She said, I never, I never knew just how bad, how painful, how nasty this was going to be. And of course it left her for the short period during recovery uh, with huge scarring all over her face a bottom lip that didn't match her top lip, so it was a constant, like a tap dripping all the time, just constantly drip, drip, drip. Uh, yes, they told us, but but they cannot ever give you the, um, the the insight to just exactly how this is going to impact on you, uh, on both the carer and, and the patient. So I, I would say, um, yes, we got an explanation, no, we got we didn't get an understanding. Okay. That makes sense. Can I, can I just jump in there with a follow up point to Derek's, if I may? I think that's a really good point that that speaks um, to the importance of um, support groups um, of talking to other patients and carers that have been through it to hear what they, you know, really felt about it. You know, I, th I think it really highlights a really important point. Sorry, I'll be quiet now. No, that's great. Um, <laughs> 
let me hear from the other people uh, on the panel as well, and I'll, I'll call them off. Um, and, and then um, actually, when we get to Whitney, Whitney, because I'm trying to divvy up the questions, uh, I'm curious what your experience has been, Whitney, also uh, trying to work with support groups. We've had a really hard time in the Boston area creating support groups, and Kylie knows that. Um, Justin, your thoughts on preparation when you're working with patients? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think the 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 issue with um, supporting people is, as I said in my talk, first thing is knowing why they're coming to speak to you, because <laughs> I think there's such a range of uh, issues that people can uh, experience when they have their treatment. I think I'm also very mindful as well, and I think Derek, you sort of maybe alluded to this somewhat, but this sense of some people are being given a lot of information and they're completely overwhelmed with the whole diagnosis. The next thing you come along and see the next person is you're going to have difficulty with swallowing. You then see the next person say you might need to have a tube feed. Um, there's all of those things. So I think it's about really making sure that the information we provide is tailored. And we know from research that's been done by um, from my colleagues in Newcastle and Australia as well, that people have different information needs and that different timings, and we need to be sensitive to that. That's all part of the personalised care approach. Um, and for some people, they'll get an information sheet and never read it again. Mm. And then for other people, uh, you know, they want to have an online opportunity. I think what's important, and one of the things that came out of our co-design work, is while some of the healthcare professionals felt we should have more uh, dietitians, speech therapists, nurse all together. Some of our, the other uh, staff who contributed to that said, actually, I think swallowing is really important. I think nutrition is really important. And if you've got a nurse in the room as well who's talking about wider issues, some of that can get lost. So again, while it might mean more appointments, it does lend itself to think about, is this the sort of person who's going to respond well to one profession at a time? or a group of professionals together, do we need to come back to that person? But preparation is all important. And as I said through that Johns Hopkins study, I like people who I see to know that we, we as a team are going to walk through the, the treatment with them and support them throughout. Um, and we're not just sending them off with information. It is a partnership going through. Thanks. Ian, you and I do some big surgeries. Uh, it's, you know, we try to prepare patients. And as you heard, sometimes there's preparation, but there's not understanding. What are your thoughts? You know, it's a difficult balance, isn't it? Because every patient's an individual, as we, as we just heard there, you might go into a surgery and two millimeters might make the difference between taking out someone's eye or not taking out their eye. So even though there are very general side effects associated with most head and neck cancer treatments, they're also extremely specific complications that depend on the details of the patient, the details of the tumor. There's also you asking patients to make one of the most difficult decisions that they'll ever have to face. And at the same time, putting them in such a, under so much stress with a diagnosis, a new diagnosis of cancer, that it's, it's difficult to make good decisions when you're under stress, but it's inevitable. And there's a clock ticking as well. And so you've got to make a decision relatively quickly because otherwise the decision makes itself. And those, those combined to make it a challenge and, you know, it, providing information. Some of our patients read better than others. Some prefer online, as just, Justin was saying. Some really don't want very much information at all. So it is difficult. And I don't think you ever provide all the information exactly how the patient and the family group of, I mean, we should be thinking of them as well, um, exactly how they want it. And so when you look back at, or when the patients look back, it's very difficult or impossible, I would say, to be perfect. But I think, you know, as Justin was saying there, that it's not just a one-off. There's a whole team and there's a, the information continues to be provided to patients and their carers throughout treatment and beyond. And uh, when you talk about surgery, Arthur, I mean, there's, in, in the UK, there are certain legal requirements for right. the amount of in, information and so on that have to be given. Um, and uh, so the focus of information provision changes from the initial diagnosis to planning treatment. And um, I think, again, you rely on the understanding of the whole team, understanding the patient and family to try and predict what they want to know, how they want to receive it, how quickly you can give the information. That's an, some people demand a lot of information. Other patients will feel overwhelmed and scared by information. And so there has to be a kind of individualized approach, even though largely you're giving similar information 
to you know similar patient groups. But it's difficult, and it's it's uh, it's obviously one of the challenges of providing this uh, service as we all do. I'm muted. That's rare. Uh, it's hard to shut me up. So uh, one, oh, yeah, sure, one of the things that was really important that came through our experience-based co-design work is that the people using the services were really positive. They wanted to make sure that everyone was giving the same message and that's what they really liked. That whoever they saw as Ian said in the team, is the speech therapist saying the same thing as the oncologist and the dietitian? Because that's that's so important to them. It's when people start giving mixed messages that can be really um, challenging for people as well. So consistent messages from the team is so important. Great point. Kylie, anything we missed here in terms of preparation? And then I'll go to Whitney as well. Um, just they both kind of hit the nail on the head there. I mean, support, also getting onto the patient's level. Everyone's different. Like um, uh, people might prefer certain information in certain ways. So I really try to feel out the patient and let them know that, I try to be honest and upfront and that, of course, you want them to know everything and what's to come, but also to give them hope that you aren't the only one going through this. People do get through this. I make references um, to different people. Uh, you know, I said, if they can do it, you can do it. Things like that. Um, I think also what Justin mentioned, the same message is super important. And one thing that we do over here um, to kind of help with that is I uh, work really closely with the speech therapist, of course, and we do co-sessions. So we treat the patient together, um, especially in the post-treatment phase. If we're trying to wean someone off a of tube feeding, um, we will discuss diet and texture together. And then I'll give them instruction on how to start to cut back on the, the feeding. So I think clear messages, but also just the message of hope and getting onto their level and what, what they prefer. Hey, thanks. And now to you, Whitney, same question, anything we missed. And then I am going to ask you to also touch on what Emma said about uh, support groups, which, as I said, in the Boston area, we've had a hard time. So first of all, anything we missed in terms of preparation of patients, Whitney? I don't think so. I think everybody pretty much covered it. I mean, I, I like to try to prepare people at that initial nutrition appointment that they have with me about um, side effects, whether they be ones that they're going to experience um, in the present moment or during treatment or maybe in, um, in the future. Um, cause I, like I said, I do have a lot of patients that tell me that they were not told about some of the side effects. So I think it is important. Um, another thing that's important is to educate your uh, medical staff. Um, a lot of times there are a lot of people that come into cancer care that, um, may have different levels of experience. So I try to give, give a lot of talks and education to various units of the cancer world or the cancer staff um, on nutrition and various types of cancer um, and things to expect. So I think knowledge is power. Um, if people are hearing that from somebody who is certified in nutrition and oncology, um, that they, uh, they, again, understand it a little bit better themselves. Um, and then as far as the support groups, um, our experience here at uh, in Fredericksburg, so probably about two years ago, um, we had some interest actually from one of our ENT uh, physicians about starting a support group. And it's it actually uh, came from an individual who um, was having a lot of trouble and didn't have a lot of support. So we did start a head and neck cancer support group. Um, and initially, I would say the numbers kind of boomed with it. Um, it does kind of ebb and flow as far as attendance, um, but I think it's important to still continue. I mean, I think if you help one individual, um, if say there's like two or three people in the meeting, I mean, if you're helping one individual, you are helping somebody who has had neck cancer. Um, so that that is important. So it doesn't have to be all about the amount of people that are in a room with a support group. It has to be about helping the people that are there and that that are really coming for that support. Um, we also try to have um, unique speakers. Um, there were topics that I never, I honestly never knew as a dietitian that people would be interested in. We had somebody who came in and, and uh, showed, we probably had four or five people at this meeting, but we had somebody who came in and brought in one of the lymphedema garments um, and we had different individuals in there trying it on. We have somebody come and talk about um, lymphatic massage and the importance of actually going to a legitimate person for that. Um, so I think the topics too have to be uh, kind of interest and variety and you need to get that from the support group. 
Um, so, and another thing is constant communication. Um, I, I don't feel, I, I, I actually was sending out emails to people, you know, what kind of topics do you want? Um, you know, this is the topic that's going to be presented. You know, we have several individuals that are interested and would like to talk to people um, who are starting treatment, would like to talk to people who have been through this experience. So that brought in individuals that had already gone through um, treatment and could share their experience. And there are a lot of individuals like that out there. They want to help other people who, have, who are going through something that they have gone through. Um, so I think all those different um, points are key when you're having a support group. Great, thanks. Arthur, can I, yes, can I mention something? Um, yes. I think on the basis of support groups, you know, ever since we started our support group, which is the Swallows, um, we've done 115 now consecutive monthly meetings, never miss a monthly meeting. Um, and in Blackpool, that takes some doing because our weather isn't as nice as in America and Australia and the rest of the world. It's one of the blowest, coldest, wettest places you can ever come and visit. But I'd recommend it to everybody. Then you'll appreciate the world when you go away. Um, yeah. But we've we've had every meet, And, you know, Derek is our lead now for Blackpool. Derek would go to that meeting for half past six in the evening. We start at seven o'clock and we don't finish till half eight. Now, if nobody turns up, Derek will still be there that whole time because we've had patients that suddenly come in at quarter past eight because they've got enough courage to walk around the hotel and then suddenly walk in. You only have to not be there once, and then they never come back. And not only that, when they're in the waiting room talking to their fellow patients, they'll be saying, well, don't go there. There's no one ever, ever there. Even though you've just had a 10 minute because you thought no one's coming. And we've always said one person helped is a million times better for that one person. You know, 1% difference makes a 100% difference to that patient. And on the basis support group, it's not just about meetings. You know, we're doing our support group um, boxes at the moment. Every patient that needs one, we send out a support box to that is supported by all our supporters and our, and our wonderful companies that support it. Sharon's just been to the shop to bring back a load of stuff so we can get 10 boxes out today. And they, you know, they're costing £10 a piece to send out. Never mind what's in the box that's been donated, but a support group is more than just sitting in a room and talking. And, you know, we mustn't forget our carers in that meeting. You know, I'm sending out things like this, things like the sprays, things like those, things like the little mouthwashes, Dr. Hef mints. You know, we've got a whole box of food going out because the hospital here in the UK can't get stopped because of COVID. It comes down to us as a charity to send those out. And I, you know, I'm going to ask a question now, which is, you know, I've got the world listening now and I've got two great people, which is Ian and I've got Justin. You know, charity is great, but in COVID times, funding's hard. Now, from my point of view, how can we get commissioners to suddenly realise the importance that the work like Emma and ourselves are doing for you guys in the hospitals, because at the moment, it's a completely free service. Now, in normal times, it's okay. We have fundraisers. We have people out there. The Mouth Cancer Foundation do some great work. But at the moment, all our charities are, I would say, a thousand times busier with less money. Now, you guys are right at the front of it. And I know, Justin, you're a great speaker for the UK. And I know, Ian, you are for Scotland. Somewhere along the line, we need to change commissioners to realise the importance of the work that we do. And I think there should be some money to help us deliver this service. So, Ian, your thoughts? On central funding for patient support groups? Yeah. Is that, is that your question? Yeah. Instead of um, it going to the hospital but they commission us to deliver the service for you. Sure, well, there's obviously pro, I would say there's pros and cons of it. One of the advantages of support groups is they are separate to the hospital care. 
Um, and I suspect patients engage in a different manner when it's not delivered by the hospital. Um, certainly having been at some of your virtual meetings, there's uh, certainly a different vibe to the consultation I have with somebody sitting in the Edinburgh Cancer Centre. Um, I think charities throughout the UK are struggling during COVID. I mean, this is a real problem for charitable, like CRUK shops are shut in practice. That's a real problem for them because they're not generating the money. And we're going to see an impact of this flow through not, I'm not really thinking about support groups specifically, but support groups obviously affected research studies funded by, um, by CRUK and the, the charitable bodies. Uh, we're seeing grant deadlines put, postponed and pushed back. And there's a hope that they'll recover from that. But, uh, um, you know, there's, the, there's been some interest in this peer-to-peer -peer support group that might lend itself well to the kind of pandemic support system that I think you've been pushing on. But again, it's not funded by hospitals or commissioners, and that's likely to cross commissioning boundaries as well, which makes that more of a challenge to get them to provide. Um, so I think that over the last 10 or 15 years, there's been quite an increase in funding for things like clinical nurse specialists to help support patients. But you're right, I don't think there's been any funding that I know of coming directly from state for patient support groups. And it's, it's largely landed at the door of the charitable sector. But in some ways, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. COVID obviously is a very extreme example of you know, disruption to uh, um, organized systems. Um, but do you, do you feel, Chris, that it would be better if, it, if your charity were state funded rather than supported by charitable donations? No, I'm not saying that the, the, the thing I never want to do is get to where a, a funder tells me what we can and can't do. Because sure. then that way I might as well come and work for the hospital and the NHS and that's the last thing I want to do because you guys are the experts. <laughs> um, but what I think they should be doing is allocating some money that comes to us, even if it's an unconditional grant that allows us to deliver the service to a bigger audience. And if every commission department put 1% of their budget to people like ourselves, then Emma, myself, the Mouth Cancer Foundation, or Cancer Foundation could all deliver one hell of a better service. But yeah, I, I agree with you. I never want it to be that we are governed by the NHS or the commissioners because that, that puts us into a different ball game. You know, our regular monthly meetings now, virtual, have 120 people plus every month on that meeting. So, you know, we, we get to a big audience. Patients want to listen, like Emma said, to another patient. Carer wants to talk to another carer. You guys do what you do the best. But at the end of the day, on our 24-7, they all say, this is what I've been told to do. Is that the best for me? Should I be doing it? Shouldn't I be doing it? What really does that mean to me and my family? And when I get a 78-year-old man asking me, why the heck did I survive cancer? because of what they've left me with, then there's a, there's a place for us as peer-to-peer -to, -peer to be able to offer that support. And it must make your jobs an awful lot easier if we smooth them through their journey. Yeah, I mean, so, I think... That, oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. Go on, no, carry on, Justin, because I'm on my soapbox, so no, I'm going to get off it. No, 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 no. We will signpost people to groups like the Swallows and Heads Together, whichever group um, you know people have access to. We have the booklets and all the rest of it. But I think for exactly what you said and what we've said about consistent messaging, I think that's. I can't speak to the funding side of things because, as Ian said, you know, the charitable sector is having a rough time at the moment, no doubt, and uh, and you know, healthcare budgets nationally are having a rough time. But what is important, and I, we keep coming back to the word collaboration and working together, I think is to make sure that we have good relationships between our clinicians and the hospital, people like Ian and his colleagues and people like my speech therapy, dietetic colleagues, etc., so that we can make sure that if people are coming to the Swallows group for advice and support because they've been told 
X, Y, or Z hospital. But we've worked in sufficient partnership with the Swallows Group to make sure that you're also supporting that consistent messaging. Because um, for me, that can that there's an ongoing relationship with the patient and the caregiver beyond that treatment, as we know for many years uh, quite often. To maintain that trust and maintain positive relationships, I think both the, from a clinical perspective and a charitable perspective, we have to work very closely. Events like today where and tomorrow where people are going to learn together, share information, but ultimately be giving consistent messaging to people at a time when there's a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, fear, uh, etc. So, I mean, we've just taken on an advocate in London because we get so many phone calls and so many people contact us from the London area. So we know there's a need. So we've just taken on a lady who her brother is a patient survivor and she what they both want to give something back. So they become advocates for London. So, you know, it is about that collaboration, Justin, and I believe, you know, we've got a great collaboration, but I do think there's more that we can do on this. And that's why I love this type of event, because it opens sometimes not nice conversations to have. But it, if we're all there with an open mind, we can all make a difference. And, you know, and I know Emma does some phenomenal work, yet sometimes she struggles to get that message over to some hospitals, which is, I think, is, which is criminal. So I do think there's a lot more work to do for us all. Um, and as I say, Justin and Ian, I know you're two great drivers, otherwise you wouldn't be here at the conference. So, you know, I think if nothing else, whoever's listening to this and you guys, if we can take this away, then great. Because at the moment, from the Swallows point of view, we're doing some fantastic collaboration in America, Australia, in Spain, in Japan now. And, you know, they are so more open to this collaboration word than some hospitals here in the UK. And I don't include people like yourselves, guys, but there are some hospitals that think they know best and they've always done it their way and they'll always do it their way. And I think that's where the message needs to be changed. And now I'm coming off my soapbox. Yeah. We have a, we have a few of those in Boston <laughs> on every street corner, pretty much. So uh, anyway, uh, what do we have about 10 minutes left, Chris? Five minutes. Five minutes. Well, um, does anyone on the panel want to, I, I mean, I did have one more thing, uh, you know, actually um, Whitney kind of in soccer terms kind of tossed up a nice uh, corner kick for me to head in, which was, I was going to ask about lymphedema. Uh, someone asked a question about physiotherapy, so I don't want to miss that one. Um, let's see, Debbie Richardson, University Hospitals of Derby, or Derby, and Burton NHS <laughs> Foundation Trust. Hey, Derby again, Arthur. Derby. <laughs> Could I ask what if uh, any experience of physiotherapy is involved in head and neck uh, cancer services? So I, I'd like to talk about phys physiotherapy, um, lymphedema, you know, McNeil dysphagia, and, and uh, in particular, you know, I have a patient who is 20 years out from head and neck cancer treatment, actually was treated elsewhere, came to me, uh, was swallowing fine, and now is G-tube dependent, um, survivor of cancer. He's a guy, he's probably 60, he's a little older than me, I'm 56. And over the last few years, developed such bad dysphagia from his uh, head and neck radiation. He had a neck dissection and radiation that he is almost completely fibrosed. So uh, who wants to talk about physiotherapy? Um, anybody, you know, how you coordinate it? Or, I mean, I know we don't have any actual physical therapists or physiotherapists on the call. Um, who wants to go first? Kylie, you want to talk about how we coordinate that or? Um, yeah, sure. Um, so for us, we again, kind of talking about our multi-disc team, um, speech, one of our speech therapists is specialized in lymphedema treatment, which becomes amazing for our patients because in the post-treatment phase, that is a big issue with fibrosis. Um, and she's trained to do um, the actual um, lymphedema massage um, and actually the McNeil dysphagia therapy as well. So we are super lucky in that we have a specialist um, that, that is trained in these therapies. Um, so a lot of times it's just referring on to the, uh, her name's Katie, our speech therapist, Katie. Um, but a lot of times she's already part of the process and already treating them for dysphagia. So she'll take it on 
take it upon herself. Also in our um, post-treatment phase, we see patients in our multidisciplinary clinic every three months um, for the first two years. And that way, if anything does start to arise, um, Katie is able to assess you know, the patient right then and there, and then suggest that they um, enter the program or see her for more therapy. So in, with, in regards to our um, cancer center, we're pretty lucky um, where she's trained in those things. Thanks. And as Kylie said, we do every three months for the first two years. We then do every six months for the next three years, then once a year for the rest of their lives. Until I die, they'll be stuck seeing me. <laughs> uh, Jessica, maybe you want to take this one next and then uh, Whitney along the lines of, uh, you know, physiotherapy, uh, McNeil dysphagia or any of those, neck massage, et cetera. Arthur, just so you know, we do have Ben tomorrow talking about this subject. So Ben will be talking okay. about it tomorrow, who's a pension survivor. Okay, great. Um, I guess not from my point of view, uh, yeah, we, we, we unfortunately we're seeing people who are now uh, not only experiencing acute problems with their swallowing, but also in the much longer term, people who have swallowed very well for a number of years and then suddenly start running into trouble. Um, and yes, we, we use bolus-driven therapy as well as part of that. Uh, and there's been some great work going on from my colleagues at MD Anderson uh, around Spiritual muscle strength training, bonus driven therapy, boot camp type approach. Um, and also, for, there's been great work going on there as well around the lymphedema and colleagues in Australia, University of um, Queensland, have just been publishing some great work on lymphedema as well. I think it's all about your MDT and knowing who's around. And we're very fortunate, our lymphedema therapists are right next door. We can get them, our people seen as part of a comprehensive package of care. In terms of physiotherapists, while we don't necessarily have physiotherapists attached to um, our team as what we call a core member of the team, we have access to physiotherapists who are absolutely brilliant in supporting people, for example, around recovery uh, from the point of view of neck dissections, etc., um, if required, um, and are just generally available. But it's about that's the beauty of the head and neck multidisciplinary team, it's reaching out to those people as you need them, but also knowing what they provide. And that's, that's so important. Um, but yes, the late dysphagia stuff is, uh, it's, it's an issue and we're seeing it more. So thanks. Whitney, any thoughts? Um, yeah, it, it's, it's tough in our area too. We actually only have um, one physical therapy group that does um, lymph lymphedema for uh, head and neck and, and treatment for that. So um, that's unfortunate. Um, but again, it, it is available and we try to identify it. Again, I think the big piece with uh, lymphedema is the educational piece of not only uh, patients, but staff members as well. Um, I think it's being missed a lot. Um, and that patients really could benefit from understanding a little bit more about it um, and knowing also like signs and symptoms of it too. So, um, and then there are, um, I'm not sure if anybody's ever had dealt with like massage therapists that um, are, you know, certified in that as well. Um, but we do have a gentleman um, in our area who does um, lymphatic massage for head and neck cancer. And again, I mean, it, I think the certifications are important too because you, you, you don't want to do harm to the patients either. So we're close to closing. I want to get closing thoughts from Emma, a patient on the line here, and then from Ian, our president so of the conference. So Emma, final closing thoughts, anything we missed, anything? Yeah, I just want to follow up actually on this lymphedema physio um, conversation, which is um, really great to hear this discussed because lymphedema, I think, is really important and um, could be, you know, um, more of a light shone on that i think also from a patient perspective what i've learned with those of with those patients who have been treated and who are lucky enough to age because aging is a privilege um as time goes on i think you have to sort of adapt a little bit i, I always found that driving my car really helped because i had to look like this and I try and incorporate little things into my life and I know it might sound silly but it, it, it actually I can be think can be quite helpful and um, more generally I just like to say it's great to be in part of this discussion it's great to be um collaborating with you all and um, thank you for having me look forward to the rest of the conference well thanks great job Ian close us out my man okay so it's been a good first part of the first day with a focus on you know patient experience and survivorship we might say uh i think what we've heard is this the, i suspect what we'll see over the next 20 years or so is a change from a focus on acute and early 
side effect management and discussion, information provision, things we've talked about, to thinking more about the long-term survivorship. Because just thinking about the last topic we discussed, lymphedema management, we have core members of our multidisciplinary team in the UK who deliver surgery, radiation, dietetic support, speech therapy, but that Almost every single patient develops lymphedema, and we do not consider that a core member of the team. And it's very hit and miss in the UK whether there's anybody local who can provide that kind of support. But I suspect as with the survivorships, uh, it becomes a more important part of head and neck management. Hopefully we'll see that developing within the core competencies of an MDT. And the, this kind of conference uh, the focuses on clinicians' minds and commissioners' minds, if Chris has got his, uh, gets his way, uh, on the long-term survivorship can only be a good thing for patients with head and neck cancer. Well, that was great. I'd like to thank you all. Thank you to all our panelists. I think that was outstanding. Uh, thank you to the audience who stayed with us and, uh, you know, keep the questions coming. Uh, Chris can always give you our contacts, certainly mine. I'm very reachable uh, and I appreciate it all. Have a nice lunch and we'll be back. Chris, when are we back? Arthur, Arthur we've um, had a poll running while you've been in your session. And uh, I'm just going to give you the results, if that's okay. And Is that my Is that my Biden won? Pardon? Biden won? Yeah. No, it wasn't, about, it wasn't about your beard as well, Arthur. And it <laughs> certainly weren't about the jokes you've been doing all morning. But the question was to the audience, do we need a navigator within a patient and caregiver's pathway? That was the question we put out to everybody. And the result is 93% said yes. So, um, and whether they're including their CNSs or whatever they call, but 93% preferred the word navigator and would like to see a navigator within their journey. Cool. So that's the first poll that's come out. So at least that's going to open some debate going forward with what we call a person like our CNS. So yeah. thanks, guys. Fantastic. We are starting again at 2 o'clock, and hopefully I'll see you all then. Um, and uh, thanks for today, and I'll speak to you all later. Cheers, Thank all. You. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.